afternoon. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I do uh, um, recognize all um, senior and vice chancellors, uh, all protocols observed um, in person and online. Um, we will continue to acknowledge um, senior people as they as they come to the room. So my name is Irene Anofrimpong. I work um, with the Forum for Research, uh, Forum for Agricultural Research in Africa, FARA, and I'm pleased to be your master of ceremonies uh, for the side event. Um, just as a reminder also um, for the participants online, because this uh, session is being recorded, uh, we kindly ask you to mute um, your sets and to use the chat box uh, for any questions or queries. And of course, at the end of the session, there, there will be an opportunity to engage uh, with you. Um, the structure of this side event is very straightforward. The side event is going to be um, led and uh, by a, a chair, which I will, who I will introduce in, in a second. And then there will be two aspects. There will be um, keynotes and also scene setting presentations. And then there will be a panel, a facilitated panel discussion. And we're looking forward to having a, a good long session where we will do um, um, a discussion or question and answer session. So um, if I may um, now introduce uh, my chair for this side event. Our chair for this side event is Dr. Hansiom Lutzea. Um, he is an active senior, the SCAR Secretariat of the EU Africa Union Food Systems and Research and Innovation, Horizon Europe, Food Systems Partnership. He was previously the Senior Policy Officer at the Directorate General Research and Innovation of the European Commission, based in Brussels, and in the Bioeconomy and Food Systems Unit. He was in charge of Food Systems Africa and co-chairing the EU African Union Food and Nutrition Security and Sustainable Agriculture Working Group um, of the EU, EU Partnership on FNSSA. He is the Executive Secretary of the Standing Committee on the Agricultural Research, which provides advice to the Commission, member states, and associated countries on strategic research and innovation in agriculture, food systems, and the bioeconomy. Is also the contact for the Horizon Europe uh, candidate partnerships on sustainable food systems for people, planet, and climate. Before joining the European Commission in 2001, um, Dr. Hans Jörg worked on short term assignments in Benin, in Morocco, in Brazil, and Kenya and later coordinating the German Research Ministry Food Systems Related International Research. He did his agronomy, um, he holds an agronomy um, PhD from the University of Hohenheim, Germany, with two year field studies in West Africa, Benin Republic, at the International Institute for Tropical Agriculture, IITA, one of and a key one of the CGIR centers. Colleagues here and those joining us, I am pleased to welcome to the podium our chair, Dr. Hans Lutzea.
Thank you, Irene, for these kind introductory words and welcome to you, excellencies and participants, and in a way from Yaounde to the world, because we still have more online participants than we have in the room. But I see, I mean, you had many discussions, uh, maybe exhausting meetings already in the midterm of this very interesting Uru Forum gathering. So I hope um, that with the lunch ending, more people at least have expressed that they're very interested in, in our side event and they will join us. Actually, the side event is about the International Research Consortium in the making. And this International Research Consortium had been presented at various occasions. Many organizations have already signed up to it. And it will be a platform actually for the many projects uh, which we are funding in the EU-AU partnership on food and nutrition security and sustainable agriculture. And also a mechanism to a platform for the instruments which we are using from the European Commission, from member states uh, of the EU and the AU um, for um, supporting the objectives of the Food and Nutrition Security and Sustainable Agriculture um, Partnership. And it will also widen uh, the view, for example, to the conclusions of the Agricultural Ministerial on ACIS, on Agricultural Knowledge and Innovation Systems. So um, it is an opportunity, actually, um, and we expect uh, when a support action will um, is expected to start uh, in January next year, that uh, full dynamic will unfold uh, to support this International Research Consortium uh, with in, in many aspects, which we will start to discuss uh, in our session uh, today. Um, and we also hope actually to mobilize you online and on-site participants uh, to be part of this interesting journey of the International Research Consortium. And I would like now uh, to call to the stage Antonella Sona, my colleague from the European Commission. Um, she will be introduced, uh, I think, more in detail when she will be also on the panel uh, later on. Um, and I'm happy that um, Antonella will address you with a few words uh, of opening. Antonella, over to you. Okay. Yes, good afternoon, uh, everybody and uh, dear participants uh, in, here in Yaoundé and online. Um, First of all, it's a great pleasure for me to be here in Yaoundé and uh, being able to meet directly with uh, many of the FNSSA actors that uh, will be also very active in this International Research Consortium, uh, have been active and will continue to be very active, of course. Uh, now, I want to congratulate the organizers uh, and uh, recognize the work undertaken by FARA, uh, RUF Forum, uh, and uh, uh, the African Union Commission, and the many institutions that are represented here today, both uh, I mean, in person and online, um, because these, are, these institutions are the long-standing partners uh, uh, of the European Union, of the European Commission in, uh, um, in running the FNSSA partnership. Uh, now, uh, I have been asked to say a few words from the European Union perspective here about the uh, IRC on FNSSA. And, uh, and I think that this is uh, quite a crucial moment for the IRC uh, for at least three reasons that I'm going to list. Uh, but I would like before that to mention that the, uh, this, uh, the IRC on, FNSS, on FNSSA is not the only uh, international research, research consortium that are active uh, at in the international level. Um, we
administrative, uh, let's say, administrative animals or uh, uh, kind of formal uh, um, agreements between institutions, but they are there really to provide a space for living uh, and, uh, let's say, vibrant activities for those who are on the, on the ground, both from the private and the public sector. So let me come back to this, I um, mean, three reasons why, which I think uh, really uh, justify this event today. Um, first of all, uh, in general, the cooperation between Africa and the EU is very high on the agenda of the European Union. And, uh, and as the as Hans Jörg uh, has just mentioned, uh, we have a key message and a recommendation from the a very high uh, high political level. Uh, so, in particular, from the ministers, both from the African and the European ministers of agriculture, uh, that recommend uh, to uh, make best use of the IRC. Uh, for uh, to set up a, a, a knowledge environment common Africa and EU uh, agricultural knowledge and innovation system, as we say in the European jargon. Uh, but uh, basically, this is a very strong political endorsement for the future work on both continents. Uh, this is, uh, I think, quite um, important for the work in the uh, in the next years and also for the uh, future project that is going to start uh, uh, next year for the Secretariat um, of the IRC. Um, secondly, I think that we are at the moment uh, with the uh, I mean, ongoing uh, geopolitical uh, crisis and food crisis where um, we are aware and I mean it is widely recognized that we are not on track in uh, achieving the sustainable development agenda. Uh, we are um, quite late on, uh, I mean, we are late or very late on all the sustainable development goals. And what, I, I mean, what is important for the IRC is that from the UN uh, uh, governance organizations and also from the European Union and the African Union, I think we all agree that research and innovation are really a key solution to advance so that the sustainable, sustainable development goals remain very relevant, that we want to achieve them, and that science and innovation are really a key tool to uh, to achieve them. So this was, I mean, in, uh, if you look at all the recent high-level meetings uh, or events uh, uh, at uh, the UN or uh, FAO level, for example, I mean, I think uh, uh, this is very much highlighted. So the IRC is there also for that. And then last but not least, uh, we, I mean, the, uh, the European Union and uh, in particular the agency dealing with research projects should quite soon sign uh, the grant agreement that will allocate 4 million euro to the consortium that will support the secretariat and uh, allow the international research, uh, research consortium to become operational. So uh, this is why it's, it is really uh, very timely to start already today and to advance on the work um, of, uh, of the IRC. Um, now, uh, um, I think we don't start from scratch, of course. Uh, the FNSSA is, was the first priority of the high-level policy uh, dialogue between the AU and the EU. This is uh, uh, quite important because, uh, I mean, it is also, it gives us and the IRC the role of being an example also for the other partnerships. Uh, and. Uh, and also uh, build on, uh, I mean, or um, 
yeah, build on all the knowledge that the same um, partnership has developed. So uh, all the, I think more than 300 joint projects that have been supported under the FNSSA so far, both, both from the EU side, the uh, uh, European member states and the African uh, uh, states. Uh, we know that, I mean, we had support, these 300 projects were supported by the European Union, the 27 member states and uh, 47 uh, African countries. Uh, um, we have at least a budget of about 700 uh, uh, million euro and uh, also, uh, I mean, a lot of uh, links and relationships with other initiatives and other platforms. So, uh, of course, the uh, the past uh, coordination and support action leap for FNSSA uh, set up the foundations for the IRC, uh, but uh, um, it will be so that the functioning of the IRC will be supported again under an horizon project that uh, I mean, as said, will be operational formally uh, very soon. Uh, but there are also other platforms like, for example, PANAP, which is the Pan-African Network for Economic Analysis of Policies um, that uh, works uh, in close synergies also with the IRC, in particular for to provide evidence-based knowledge for developing policies that um, will there, uh, I mean, inform uh, also the uh, agricultural and uh, agricultural innovation landscape um, in Africa and uh, uh, in exchange with the EU. Uh, there is uh, also a platform for the trade and the marketing of agri of agroecological products in Africa that is also that it is started. And also what I would like to mention is that, I mean, we have lots of examples where, I mean, we exchange knowledge, but we from, uh, from the EU side, we learned from the African experience. Uh, this is uh, true in the field of water management uh, or also, um, I mean, in uh, soil management. But uh, um, I think it, an interesting example regards the living labs or, I mean, so which is uh, a concept that we are pushing and putting forward uh, under the uh, new EU uh, mission about soil health. So uh, to create new waves of innovating uh, really on site and involving uh, all, the, I mean, all the end users and uh, local knowledge. And in, uh, in a network of uh, ongoing projects under Horizon and under the FNSSA on agroecology, we realized that Africa has already lots of experience to offer in this with uh, I mean, examples of what could be qualified as living labs in agroecology already that can then be used uh, in Europe. So I, I mean, I conclude by saying that I'm uh, quite, I'm confident that from this event, we will really get, uh, I mean, a lot of input to make the IRC lively and, uh, um, I mean, already active uh, both in Africa uh, and in Europe, and also to become the key platform for a vibrant agricultural knowledge and innovation system common to the two continents. And I look forward to discuss further with panelists and participants. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Antonella, for um, outlining the rich uh, um, cooperation between EU and uh, African Union in the past, um, as also as a mutual learning exercise, actually, with the uh, ANAP and with uh, experiences of living labs. I would now call to the stage uh, Monica. Uh, Idinova from the African Union Commission um, to showcase also that uh, the EU-AU uh, priority on food and nutrition security and sustainable agriculture was always built in close collaboration between the EU and the AU 
the roadmap, for example, which guided us for 10 years was drafted by five experts from Africa, five from Europe. And grateful that you are with us, uh, Monica, and over to you. Uh, it's your turn. Thank you very much, Hans. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is a very great privilege for me to be representing the African Union Commission uh, to discuss this the topic of um, which is very important to us, the operationalization of the International Research Consortium. As we gather here, we embark on a journey that has the potential to reshape the landscape of agricultural knowledge and innovation, which transcends through borders and bridging the two continents. The IRC represents a beacon of hope in the realm of agricultural transformation. Uh, it is the culmination of collaboration, effort, collaborative efforts, uniting the African and European research and innovation communities to address complex issues that have impeded progress for far too long. The IRC's mission is to strengthen the agricultural knowledge and innovation systems, and also to uh, accelerate the transformation of our agri, agri food systems. Today, we come together not only to discuss this operationalization, but also to emphasize the broader significance of this collaboration, which goes across the geographical boundaries and also policy priorities, touching upon the very heart of global food security and sustainable development. In the course of our deliberations this afternoon, we aim to gather insights that will shape the strategy and also operational, operational plan for the IRC. We, also, we will also work to expand the IRC membership ensuring that it encompasses a wide spectrum of dedicated actors who share our vision for a brighter, more sustainable agricultural future. Furthermore, our discussions today will provide valuable inputs for the consortium's role in the upcoming um, Food 2030 conference in December. So as we delve into the intricacies of operationalizing the IC, IRC, let us keep in mind the broader perspectives. We are not just building a consortium, but laying the foundation for resilient, prosperous, and interconnected food systems. We are also uniting diverse voices and expertise to address global challenges. In the words of Margaret Mead, never doubt a small group of a thoughtful, committed citizen. Never doubt, sorry, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's, only the, it's the only thing that ever has a small group that can change the world. Today, we are that small group, and together we have the power to, dive, to drive meaningful change. Let us seize this opportunity in the operationalization of the International Research Consortium and pave the way for a more sustainable and prosperous future that we all hope for. I want to thank you again for your dedication, your passion, and your commitment to this endeavor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Monica, for your strong commitment for your excellent outline of uh, our joint journey, actually, our joint engagement. And now I would like uh, to call to stage Akre Agumia from FARA, the Forum for Agricultural Research in Africa. And again, a longer introduction will be made when all panelists are coming to stage. Um, Agri, it's your turn. Over to you. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, uh, Chair. It is uh, a pleasure for me to uh, make some remarks on behalf of uh, FARA and the fraternity that FARA represents. This morning, uh, we're talking about partnerships. Say partnership is the thread um, which success is woven. And we mentioned three partnerships and the IRC, well, the three partnerships are the three important partnerships uh, in the research and innovation uh, education space. The IRC was cited as the third one. The other two <coughs> are the, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the other two are the partnerships between uh, or among the African institutions, partnership between the African institutions and the CGIR. The third is the uh, partnership between the African institutions and the European uh, institutions. Among the uh, African institutions, we have institutions working in, in, in Africa, including the CGR as part of the IRC. So the IRC is an extremely uh, important uh, development partnership that has been <clears throat> in the that has been in the making for now, I think, five years. Five years is a, is a long time to, to build a partnership, but it shows how careful we have been at, uh, at this process. Uh, I acknowledge uh, CIRAD, which uh, started the coordination of the process of building this partnership and well, it was later uh, followed by by Farah. Um, I want to recognize and appreciate the IRC members who have been uh, very cooperative and, and supportive of Farah in the process of uh, as Farah tech took the lead. And, and continues to do so uh, in organizing and, and shaping the uh, the IRC. Uh, we had we we, we are in this uh, during this startup phase, uh, the the current startup phase of the IRC after after the close the closure of the lead for FNSC. Uh, it is a phase when uh, operational resources for facilitating basic IRC activities have not been mobilized. Um, we have seen great uh, enthusiasm from the IRC members uh, participating in events like this, uh, in events like the one we had in Durban uh, in June, and this has helped to uh, sustain uh, the momentum of the of of, of this uh, partnership that is still uh, in the making. I want to echo the uh, observations made by Monica about the the potential that this partnership has for uh, improving. Uh, livelihoods and uh, and uh, food security and and, and and the ecosystem uh, in 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 Africa and, and in Europe. I will close by reaffirming the commitment of of FARA to continue uh, playing the role it has been playing in partnership with. Uh, the constituent African organizations that we work closely with, with those remarks. I thank you, Chair.
Uh, thank you very much, Akre, and also to the other speakers, Antonella and Monica, to outline actually the many pathways which led actually to uh, setting up an international research consortium. Um, and uh, so with these uh, introductory framing uh, made by our three initial speakers, whom you will see back uh, in the panel later on, um, for more detailed uh, discussions, we would close the initial session and come to the let's say first session uh, where we have a prominent uh, keynote, a keynote which will address uh, what we are discussing uh, today about uh, foresight, about food systems transformation. So we are talking today about uh, agri food systems, about food systems. We would. Need food systems which would need uh, co-benefits for climate, uh, for nutrition, for the environment, and built on innovation. So looking on these um, food systems, actually, which uh, will also be strengthened by innovation, by knowledge systems, by innovation which is place-based. Uh, Living Labs was mentioned, actually, and the multi-actor approach, which brings many actors together. And we are uh, grateful to have Dr. Jim Woodhill uh, with us online. So he will give a um, virtual a remote uh, presentation. Uh, he's a senior consultant with the University of Oxford's Environmental Change Institute. And actually, um, he is uh, one of the leaders of the Foresight for Food Initiative, which is a global network engaged in food foresight. And as we are starting an international research consortium, uh, it's uh, worthwhile actually to uh, take advantage of uh, foresight networks. So grateful to have um, um, the leader of um, the Foresight for Food Network with us. Um, he's a specialist in inclusive agribusiness, rural development, food security, and multi-stakeholder partnerships with over 25 years of international development experience. Formerly, Jim was a principal sector specialist for food security and rural development with the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. And prior to this, he was director of the Center for Development Innovation at Wageningen University and Research Center in the Netherlands. And he holds a PhD in political economics and a degree in agricultural science. So based on your knowledge, your networking expertise, we are happy to have you online. Uh, over to you, Jim, and we are interested to listen to your insights. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much, hans York and... Uh... Nice to hear from the other, other speakers. Uh, good afternoon, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, friends and, and colleagues. Um, <clears throat> now, with, with some of the experience you were just mentioning, and your, um, you know, one might hope that one would have some answers to all of this, but I'm afraid I don't. So I think probably what I'm going to be presenting is more some of the questions that I think we need to be exploring when we start to think about agricultural knowledge and, and innovation systems. So what I'd like to do is to just sort of prompt a little bit of thinking about what's the framing we can use when we start to think about the future of, of knowledge and innovation systems. Anyway, very great pleasure to be with you all this afternoon. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to share some thoughts and to introduce you to the Foresight for Food Network. Um, just give me a moment to share my screen <clears throat> um, and get onto the right. Yeah, hang on, I think here we go. Right, I think that's working, uh, is it? Yes, perfect. Fantastic. Thank you. So, look, what I'd like to do is just to share a few thoughts around, you know, what are some of the triggers for transforming food systems and how can we think about that in relation to the whole idea of foresight? Now, nobody in this room is under any doubt that our whole future sort of planetary human well-being really depends on our collective efforts for a very deep transformation in how our food systems um, work. 
Now, I don't think it's too extreme to suggest that we're collectively facing three you know, essentially existential crises around climate, around inequality, and around conflict. And of course, food ties all of those three big issues together. So if we want to tackle any of those things, we have to tackle this transformation in food systems. But how do we actually do that? I mean, it's very easy to talk about what we would like, but not perhaps so easy to actually bring that change around. It's after lunch. So um, just to sort of get the thinking going, let me give you a Rubik's Cube of food systems innovation. Maybe you can try and guess what some of the different dimensions of this cube might be. And I guess the challenge for us is, how do we get some of these different dimensions aligned in our innovation and our knowledge systems? So first, of course, we need to be thinking about production and resource use. But just as importantly, we have to really look at the consumption side. How's consumption side going to drive changes in the, in the food system and trigger that? And how's our consumption related to our overall well-being? And of course, there's a whole story around markets and distribution. Pretty common sense, but we do need to be thinking across the whole value chain. But then how do we get the different perspectives of different actors in the system? We need to be talking to each other. We need a whole range of different perspectives from different parts of the value chain, from different parts of society about what constitutes a better and an improved food system. We also need a whole lot of solutions. We need to work out how to have climate smart agriculture. We need to work out how to improve our value chains. We need to work out how to make effective use of AI. We need to work out how to have uh, net zero food production, et cetera. So we need some very practical solutions what I've called their prospects. And we have to work out what are the pathways we need for putting all of that into practice. And from an innovation perspective, we need to be thinking about technological innovation. We need to be thinking about institutional innovation, the laws, the policies, the frameworks, and of course, the political innovation. How do we have good governance around food systems? Now, you, you read out my background. I sort of grew up as an agricultural scientist actually focusing on soils. And I think one of the challenges we have is that historically we've tended to focus on only one of these dimensions, production and resource use in terms of product prospects and in terms of technological innovation. So how do we think about in our triggering food systems change in thinking about our knowledge and innovation systems dealing with all of these different dimensions? Another way of thinking about this is what are some of the critical processes we need to have in place for food systems change? And you know, I think many of you will know that we've, you know, I think, made some good progress over the recent years in terms of developing these national food systems transformation pathways. We've got a pretty clear idea why we need to change food systems. We've also got some pretty ambitious goals and ideas about what we would like to achieve in the future, what an improved food system might look like. But of course, in the, and that's the what. But in the middle is the how. What is the actual transformation process? And I think this has a lot more to do with a whole lot of soft stuff. You know, what societal awareness and engagement do we need? How do we build the political will? How do we underpin that with stakeholder dialogue? What sort of alliances and partnerships are critical? What does coordination, when we talk about coordination across different ministries and across different sectors, actually look like in practice? How do we get realistic about the political economy issues that really constrain or enable food systems change? You know, and so we can go on. What does a really effective innovation systems look like? Critically, how do we make sure we've got effective data systems? So I'd suggest that we're a very, very long way from getting these transformation processes right and in place. And I think that's why something like the IRC becomes really critical in supporting a whole range of institutions to work on getting this transformation pathway right and enabling us to drive change. I'm particularly interested in the role that Foresight has in driving food systems change. And I guess that's part of my link into this discussion. So what do I mean by foresight? I mean, essentially futures thinking, I think is increasingly key to understanding how we can trigger change. Historically, you know, dare I say that, you know, development financing has often tended to focus a little bit on what can be done in very practical short term ways over the next three to five years. You know, and clearly if we wanna bring these big shifts in food systems, 
we're talking about what's going to happen over 5, 10, 15, 20 years, 30 years, even longer. And we need to be thinking about what are some of the big consequences over that time period. At the same time, as we've seen by COVID, the Ukraine crisis, and now the crisis in the Middle East, we are going to be facing an increasing degree of turbulence, uncertainty, ambiguity about what's right, with risks, but also a whole lot of opportunities. So how can we explore the future to try and navigate better in these uncertain times? How do we engage with a whole range of different stakeholders in really envisaging this sort of alternative futures and create storylines that will encourage people to do something different? How do we get very clear about the implications of not taking the right decisions? And how do we think about the way we can nudge systems in more desirable directions? Now, this is the, the thinking that sits behind foresight and scenario analysis. Um, so I'm linked into all of this through the Foresight for Food Network, which is a global network of some of the international institutions, research institutions and individuals that are also really interested in how we bring foresight and scenario thinking into the challenge of cha uh, challenge changing food systems. We've had a very, very good partnership with FARA over the last couple of years, um, along with a whole range of other organisations. You, I'll show you where you can link up and find out more information about Foresight for Food later. We're also working in five different countries at the moment across Africa, the Middle East and, uh, and Asia in looking at how the Foresight work can actually support food systems transformation and link to the national pathways. I mean, just one example in, in June and again in partnership with FARA and AGRA with some support from MasterCard Foundation, we had a fascinating, inspiring week bringing together about 50 youth leaders from across Africa, really thinking about what were the opportunities for the sort of food systems youth would like to see in the future, what were the roles that they could play in helping to try and create the future they would like, and using the whole foresight and scenario framework as a way of opening up the dialogue with that group of youth. Okay, so let's just... Uh, make it a little bit more practical what we mean here. And I use this simple cartoon sometimes to explain foresight and scenarios in, in slightly simpler terms. Um, we can see the couple of ducks swimming down the river, one asking the other, shouldn't we stop to consider our options? The other one saying, why bother? Everything's going fine. And of course, you can all see the crocodile in the river. So foresight is really about thinking about the future to improve our decision making today. Scenarios are about being prepared for alternative futures and trying to create alternative futures. In this diagram, we can see a number of different scenarios. You know, do you end up as crocodile lunch? Do you have a narrow escape? Do you follow a smooth ride down a different path? Or do you think end up in an unseen dead end? Now, what's really important in all of this is understanding where our decision points lie. Because if we can do better futures thinking, it enables us to make better decisions at the right point in time to end up in a better place rather than a worse place. Perhaps a slightly more technical way of looking at this is saying, look, we can think about different futures into the there's different scenarios in the future. There's a few big trends that are going to be shaping this if we think around food systems. Now, we know what demographics is going to mean in Africa. We, we know what urbanisation is going to mean. We can see some pretty alarming trends in how diets are changing. But we also have some big uncertainties. Now, what's going to happen to global geopolitics? How resilient are we actually going to be? To what degree are we going to be able to shift the curve on what people are eating? So this thinking enables us to explore a little bit more what some of the future risks and opportunities might be, to look at what the implications might be for our programs and investments, to explore what future scenarios may be less or desirable and for who, and to really give us some better insight in how to nudge systems in more desirable rather than less desirable directions. I won't spend too much time on this, but oh, um, of course, understanding the whole system is really critical and thinking about triggers. How do we understand some of the trade-offs between our food system outcomes? How do we get a sharper understanding of all the drivers that are putting pressure on the food system? And really critically, how do we understand the different actors across the entire food system 
and what sort of incentives and drivers are really influencing their behavior. Because ultimately, a lot of this is around the incentives that will influence uh, the behavior of actors in the food system. So we need to understand how actors work in terms of the whole food system. To help engage stakeholders in dialogue around this sort of thinking, Foresight Food has developed this guiding framework. I mean, basically pretty common sense. You know, how do you work with a group of stakeholders to scope out what the process might look like? Doing a whole lot of work about mapping the food system, doing some analysis of trends and uncertainties. You know, then you can build scenarios and explore the implications of all of that for systems change. And there's a whole range of different tools that we use across these different steps. And here you can see on the right, really emphasizing the importance of having a strong evidence base but on the left, the importance of making these foresight processes very participatory, engaging stakeholders, a mechanism for improving dialogue about how to bring change in the food system. Yeah, hopefully this next framework, you know, apologies for maybe too many frameworks, but I thought, you know, this is sort of a little bit useful in terms of the thinking around the future work of the IRC. But I mean, how do we go from data to decisions? Um, so if we think about decision making and action in the food system, now ultimately we're probably looking at consumer behavior and business behavior. So what's going to shift that? Sort of a dynamic between our government policies, our broader societal understanding and the sorts of alliances for change we can create. And this is all influenced tremendously by particular interest, by culture, by mindsets, by power and politics. At the bottom here, what some of the science, local knowledge and data that we want to bring in to our decision making? Now, and we can imagine a whole range of different dimensions of, of knowledge and data that are, that are all important. But what seems to be often missing is what happens in the middle. So what's the learning and innovation process that enables us to connect knowledge insight data into decision-making and action. Now, and here, I think there's two really important points, the sense-making. How do we understand what's happening? How do we make sense of the wider environment? How do we make sense of the future? And how do we innovate to create new opportunities, new ideas, new ways of doing things? And in that, I think the foresight and scenario analysis can be super helpful in bringing stakeholders together to understand the opportunities for change. But we probably also need to be thinking a lot more about national knowledge platforms. And I think this is where there's tremendous opportunities for the sort of work that the IRC is thinking about. Now, and this is a lot about integrating information, about visualizing information and making information really accessible. So I guess what I'm trying to offer here is just some broad thinking about if we wanna trigger change in food systems, how do we get the whole knowledge innovation system working in an integrated way that's focused on shifting decisions and taking action? And finally, let's think a little bit about some conditions for systems change. And how do we go deep in what's blocking or enabling systems change? It's very easy to talk about the policies or the practices or the financial resource flows that are linked with bringing change. But for that to happen, we also need to look a little bit deeper. What are some of the really important relationships and connections? What's the relationship between business and government? What's the relationship between consumers and, and advertising? What sort of power dynamics is playing out in the food system? And underneath all of that, what are the mental models that are either locking us into old ways of thinking or perhaps opening up new ways of working, thinking more about the sort of deeper transformative change that's going to be necessary. So again, here, just as the last point, you know, how does um, this deeper thinking about systems change fit into some of the work that the IIC might be thinking about doing into the future? And I think with some very interesting and exciting opportunities there for, for what, I, what I understand you all have in mind. And yeah, very, very much looking forward to perhaps some opportunities for the foresight work to connect with what you're doing. So um, do connect with us at uh, Foresight for Food. I'm again emphasizing that we've been working in a very close partnership with FARA and the Africa Foresight Academy and looking forward to all sorts of work we can take forward there. 
you can go onto the website and pick up a whole lot of resources and further information about foresight and food systems change. So again, thanks very much for the opportunity. It's uh, been a great pleasure to be able to join you this afternoon. Thank you very much, uh, Jim, for this very thoughtful um, uh, contribution, actually uh, outlining, you were talking about food systems in plural, so which is, makes clear that there have to be different answers on different levels in different, let's say, national and regional conditions. And then outlining also, uh, let's say, the various elements of transitions when you have defined what is the way to travel um, and the answers could be different on different levels uh, and this transition agenda could also translate into maybe an agenda for the international research consortium or at least uh, elements to consider and uh, finally your outline of uh, foresight shows i think the value uh, of foresight when starting such a journey like uh, the irc at uh, the, actually, the value of foresight in uh, yeah, looking at scenarios of, of different options and um, scenarios which are more wanted than others, which are um, and nudging actually towards scenarios which we would like um, uh, to achieve. So um, I think interesting elements for further discussion. And um, I would now like... Uh, uh, to invite uh, Irene, but before, um, yeah, we, we have discussed now about, uh, or we have mentioned the International Research Consortium in various ways, and it has been presented also at uh, other occasions, but the IRC is continuously developing, and who is better placed uh, than Irene uh, Rampong to update us on the current uh, thinking uh, of um, the International Research Consortium and um, her uh, presentation um, will outline the key elements and uh, processes of opera operationalization that they built on the experience of previous programs. Uh, so Dr. Irene Anof Rampong, um, is the lead of the um, AUE FNSSA International Research Consortium in FARA, the um, Leap for FNSSA project, which made actually the first steps uh, towards uh, the IRC and got already mem many members uh, to sign. So she was coordinator of the Leap for FNSSA project um, from 21 to 22 and served as a commissioner of the CGR Commission on Sustainable Agriculture and Intensification between 2020 and 2021. She's a thought leader with over 30 years research innovation experience. Irene has developed and coordinated many continent-wide research and capacity development projects, including the GADAP R&I framework, Science Agenda for Agriculture in Africa, and she has worked in research institutes and universities in a number of African and European countries. Irene has played significant roles in advancing the AUE Research and Innovation Partnership through a number of projects and the AUE High Level Policy Dialogue Working Group, where she uh, is uh, in the uh, lead as a co chair. She is currently a member of the Foresight for Food uh, Steering Group and served uh, on the steering board group of the World Bank programs, among others. Irene holds a PhD from the Veterinary School University of Bristol, UK, and an MSc in Animal Production Science uh, from Wageningen University in, and Research. And in short, I have asked her if I have only three words to, <laughs> to describe you, animal scientist, biometrician, actually, and pro-para-biometrician. <laughs> Over to you, Irene.
Thank you, Chair, for the kind introduction. Um, my slides up. So um, we've had quite a lot um, on partnerships, and we've had the context within which the International Research Consortium is a major game player when a game changer as we move forward um, in our partnership drive to um, transform um, agriculture systems. So I will, I like to control my slides. Next slide. So by way of outline, I would like to look at the IRC, but in the context of the AU-EU partnership, because sometimes we talk about this and we're not so clear what partnership we're talking about. I will then look at the why and what of the IRC and touch on the operationalization process and of course, how to participate in the IRC. So let me situate the IRC uh, in the context of the AU EU FNSSC partnership. First of all, we must we must um, remember that even though I had the ED of FARA mentioned that the process uh, for developing the IRC started five years ago, yes, maybe decisively, but the cooperation between Africa and Europe. Um, in terms of improving research and innovation has been um, a very long process. Um, we also heard from um, Antonella that there are a number of priorities uh, that the high level policy dialogue um, that sort of convenes the research and innovation partnership between Africa and Europe um, comes up with um, from time to time. So when we talk about the partnership, we are talking about the, the policy angle, the, the, the initial push within the cooperation agreement between Af Africa and Europe research and innovation. And this is led by the EU-AU high-level policy dialogue. Now, three priorities have been put forward so far. The first, uh, which is on the food, nutrition, and uh, Security and Sustainable Agriculture, FNSSA, uh, is the context within which we are talking today. But another important uh, priority is the Climate Change and Sustainable Energy, that is the CCSC. And then a third more recent priority that we are all excited about is the Innovation Agenda. So the high-level policy dialogue so far put forward three very important and, and serious uh, priorities that should shape the research and innovation cooperation between Africa and Europe. So each of these priorities are guided by roadmaps. So for the FNSSA uh, priority, there is an FNSSA roadmap that is the main um, basis for the implementation of, of actions. So this is the first level when we talk about the FN, uh, we talk about the um, FNSSA partnership. There is a, the policy element that that gives the the direction uh, for what we do. The second that I want to introduce is also the, in addition to the policy, there is also the financing aspects that guide and that supports the implementation of the priorities so put forward. Yeah. And examples of such is what I'm showing here. The current one that I'm sure many of you know is the Horizon Europe um, that provides uh, different financing for different uh, uh, programs and actions. But we also have the FOSC. Um, which is also another important uh, financing instrument. We have the Leap Agri, a number of our 
research and you know, research institutions and universities participate in the Leap Agri um, partnership. And then also, of course, in the Africa Union research grant. Now, all these come together to support the implementation of the priorities that are set at the policy level. Thirdly, there are a number of projects that are therefore implemented uh, from um, this, um, this, this system where we have the policies and the policies are based on priorities, financing envelopes between Africa and Europe and a number of projects. Now, these are just examples of the projects. Now, just for FNSSA priority alone, and I think my next speaker will speak, but the database we have on FNSSA projects alone between Africa and Europe, it doesn't even include other continents. We have nearly 500 projects that have been implemented in different partnerships across the two continents. So you can imagine that if you then look at the other partnerships on, on food and nutrition security, it is a huge uh, space uh, that should um, go into the thinking that Jim just put forward in terms of the scenarios that we need to be thinking about if we want to change the agriculture system. But the policies uh, that cre they create the strategic framework um, are allocate and allocated resources for funding are aligned to goals and targets. So it's not just the HLPD setting. These are aligned to goals, to SDGs, to, to goals at the African Union, to goals at the um, European Commission. And so you see on top there, you see that the number of um, strategic um, goals that I put there, cut up on the Africa side, the Africa continental free trade area on the Africa side, we have on the European side, the, the European Green Deal, the farm to fork strategy. These are huge um, priority setting um, targets and goals and strategies that, that determine. So we're not just coming to the financing envelope um, without that. The next is um, also that the funding programs are therefore then targeted to these RNI uh, inputs uh, towards the policies. Then next, I must also mention that what we're looking for doing all this is to ensure that we have impact of the RNI uh, efforts and, and that it supports the progress towards the goals. And of course, the projects need to interact with local um, agriculture innovation system, enablers, RNI to demand driven and respond to the pre existing and, um, of course, global needs. So there's a whole link. And now there is also a, a back a feedback a flows of knowledge from the projects, um, also go to um, the programs and let you learn from that. Uh, the synthesis of those lessons and, and helps us to project outputs and analysis and outcomes, and, and that informs the financing. And of course, back to the policy, these programs enable the policy to better respond to existing and global needs by communicating the key information from projects. So. Colleagues, the partnership we're talking about is not just actors coming together and talking and liking each other and deciding we're putting money to support anything. This, as the ED said, is has been worked on for a long time. It's, it's careful, it carefully thought through um, uh, process, and we continue to learn because we charter new waters, we we, we charter new uh, partnerships, and of course. We have an, a number of systems drivers that continue to um, shake the, the, the futures that we anticipate. So when we talk about the partnership, this is the context within which the International Research Consortium sits. And this is why the RNI outputs, the RNI outputs tied to institutional funding 
um, should be supported so that they are not left on the shelf. You know, when we just say, oh, we do a lot of research and they are left on the shelf, we just say it passes. But it takes a whole lot to be able to deal with bringing those research off the shelf to ensuring that we have the innovation that matter and that we have the impact that matter and that we're changing lives and, and, and ensuring that we're reducing poverty and we're being sensible about it and ensuring that our, our environment is um, also maintained the way it should be. Um, again, the project and programs currently are many. I cited 500 just on the FNSSA between Africa and Europe. Um, so it appears that we are doing a lot and many of us are not aware of each other. We're not aware of what the other projects are doing and there's quite a lot that um, we need to grapple with um, before priorities are set and before investments are made. So it appears that a lot of the investments are trickling, you know, we're, we're actually losing a lot of investment because we are not targeting properly and, and we're flying blind. So that that needs to be fixed. And, and it's, it's an important element uh, when we consider the innovation uh, in, in international research consortium. So it is not for nothing that the AU-EU partnership decided that it's high time we set a platform that is long-term enough that can take care of all these dynamics and, and the complexities and be able to tie the partnership together to deal with this and, and that we avoid the fragmentation um, that we have currently in the, in the RNI system. So the next slide talks about the why, and I've already explained the why, so I'm not going to talk much. It is only articulating why the IRC is so pertinent and almost an imperative. We have to ensure that we move forward and that we deal with some of these um, underachievements because we're not able uh, to know what everybody is doing everywhere and we're not able to be efficient in um, appropriating resources. So the IRC is meant to improve coordination and, in create, and create the synergies between the many research and innovation programs, facilitate liaison between them and the initiatives and ensure that there is a serious policy dialogue uh, between the AU and the EU that facilitates um, the, the impact that we're looking for. So the, the issue of fragmentation I often say is one of the broad or singular problem that the IRC is set to address, making it very focused because a huge, a huge problem that we feel that this issue of fragmentation underpins a lot of these problems. And as we begin to know what everybody else is doing and, and we're able to invest more efficiently, some of the other issues may begin to go. Next slide. So the International Research Consortium is envisioned to strengthen linkages among different actors and research stakeholders, and enable them to form uh, different levels of partnerships and clusters, identify common issues and joint solutions, and manage uh, and communicate uh, knowledge, experience, and insights, and be able to mobilize resources and channel them uh, in a more efficient way. So as a vision statement, the IRC is a bi-continental platform, often called a network of networks, and I'll explain why, linking all actors in research and innovation in African and European member states to advance a science-led growth in sustainable growth and nutrition security, sustainable food and nutrition security, based on, and this is important for me, equity, and common priority agendas and scaling and impact with global spillovers. So we talk about Africa and Europe, but we're also fully aware that when it comes to research and innovation in terms of borders, there are important uh, spillovers that we would anticipate emerging. So 
the IRC uh, confers higher impact or is expected to confer higher impact on um, research and innovation by cross-disciplinary learning. And for me, I think this is very important for, for, for the universities and of course for any institution that is interested in um, cross-learning and improving um, what we are doing today based on our lessons. It also confers, uh, provides a lot, large knowledge and a database that ensures higher efficiency. As I said, if you are in the IRC, you have access to know what's going on, which projects are going on, which partners are doing what, and therefore you're able, uh, you have a bit more efficient. And of course, it promotes interaction between partners and of course, joint funding. You're able to find partners um, to be able to have a good partnership program with and provides, of course, a two-way communication uh, that facilitates the AUP science policy interface. So that's what we are envisioning this international research consortium uh, to be about. As I said, it is a member-based multi-actor platform because we've learned over the years that, I mean, it is, it is better to work together and no, so many multi-stakeholder partnerships have shown the superiority of um, good partnerships that actually work together on a purpose. So it is one such, but it is also seen as a network of networks. Reason being that already we have many networks. We just heard from Foresight for Food Network. Globally, they are bringing all Foresighters together. They are thinking together. They are coming up with new models. <laughs> they are sol solving um, uh, new, new, new problems and finding new solutions. That's a huge platform. We have the CGIR. Now they are talking about one CGIR. Massive platform. We're talking of Rufor. Rufaru has moved from 10 universities to 147 universities across 40 countries in Africa. A huge network. Um, we are talking FARA that works with the, all the four sub-regional organizations to reach all the African countries. Huge platform on research. We're talking of AFAS. This morning we heard they have uh, at the country level um, national fora across many African countries that bring research and innovation actors, private sector together at the country. Huge network. We have Fan Fan, another big network that looks at policy. I can go on and on. So if you take the African Union Commission alone, it sits on a whole lot of huge platforms, huge networks. The European Commission alike, huge networks, huge platforms. So this IRC looks to just add value to what these networks are doing. So it's, it's going to ride on the networks, but it's going to add value on where the networks uh, need, need to, to be strengthened. So that's why we're saying it's built as a network of networks. It is, it is at that level that we discuss the IRC. But that said, let's also remember that even though it is a network of networks, because of the linkage across the networks, the IRC reaches the local actor. Because these networks will feed from the countries, will feed from local action, and the real actions on the ground will again be supported by the IRC. And that's the beauty. So the IRC also rests a lot on advocacy and outreach approach. And, and going forward, in terms of our processing of, um, of operationalization, that's a key element. And we're looking um, to set the IRC up as a, a go-to place for supporting all these initiatives and ensuring alignment. And if we can ensure alignment, then we'll begin to reduce the duplication uh, and promote complementarity instead of competition among partners. The, at, the, at the policy level, we're expecting the IRC to serve also beyond the FNSSA priority, to serve other priorities, as I mentioned, the climate change, the sustainable energy priority, as well as the innovation agenda 
priority. And of course, uh, the European Green Deal, the, the AU um, African Continental Free Trade Area. So five key functions and services we highlight uh, for the IRC is to increase synergies and coherence between actors, to provide access to a learning environment and knowledge base, including a monetary evaluation and learning um, process and capacity building. Thirdly, to focus on capacity building. This morning, I think we've had capacity, capacity, capacity is one of our main problems, uh, individually, institutionally, and systemically. And to thirdly, to provide a sustainable and inclusive governance structure, and of course, to strengthen the science policy interface. This last point, we say it very easily, but I know it is a different dynamic altogether when it comes to science policy interface. Those who are engaged in it will tell you. What is the governance structure we're uh, putting forward? The IRC, if you look at it from what I've described, looks very complicated. But interestingly, the governance is very simple. And at the governance level, we will have we have four functions, a strategic function, advisory function, operational function, and a support function. And at the strategic level, we're putting forward the General Assembly that includes all the members of the IRC, the council that will stand in between um, the, uh, the General Assembly meetings. Secondly, there will be an advisory, uh, external advisory committee that will be set up by, I think, a team of um, experts on their own right and merit. And then thirdly, there is an operational function, which is what everything that we are talking about. And we're calling them working groups. And you soon understand that these working groups could be regional working groups, they could be thematic working group, they could be um, interests, different um, interests, funders working groups. So these working groups really are at the heart of how the IRC functions. And of course, um, the main support function is a secretariat that will be the glue to link to all these government structures. So, and we're saying that the, the support function is going to be on a, a rotating basis. So what's the operationalization process? Um, as we said, the IRC was launched last year under a Horizon 2020 uh, coordination support action called Long-Term Africa-Europe Partnership on Food, Nutrition, Security, and Sustainable Agriculture, LEAP for FNSC. Now, this was a, 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 a coordination support action that led to the launch of the IRC. Now, going forward, we are anticipating another coordination support action under the Horizon Europe. That will help now to operationalize the IRC so launched, um, including the governance um, structures that I've just uh, indicated. It will help to develop that learning environment I mentioned about at the m and &E. we'll hear about the, the, the knowledge platform. It will develop a sound method of analysis for r &I activities and identifying research gaps, and therefore providing a basis for updating our roadmap from time to time. And then, of course, um, it will increase the synergies and coherence uh, between the actors, uh, research and innovation projects and initiatives. Um, and of course, the funding programs that are linked to them uh, institutionally. Um, Now I put this out here. Put this out here to explain, or maybe this summarizes what I'm trying to say. So process-wise, we are operationalizing um, the IRC in another uh, CSA, in another coordination support action. 
And the, we are anticipating two aspects of this process. The first aspect we call the startup. The startup basically will consolidate what we have gained from the previous project that launched the IRC. And a number of areas uh, we are going to consolidate. You hear from one of them. We will also try to put in place uh, the structures for the governance in the startup phase. So the earlier part of this new CSA will look at that. Then there will be the pilot phase that will now try to pilot the working groups that I talked about in different ways. Uh, working group on knowledge management and communication on gender, different thematic areas, uh, be it soil health or um, other climate change or agroecology or different themes. And then there will be a funders uh, working group. So what we are anticipating is that after the pilot, we will then finish off the next CSA by a fully functional IRC that is set with these governance structures within the FNSSE partnership on the, the, on the left hand side. So this, this is the schema um, for the IRC. So I think I've said this already, so I will not repeat it, but let me just mention that the, the principles I've just mentioned, they combines to reveal the relevant um, related services, delivery mechanisms uh, to be provided by the IRC for the members, because it's a member-based platform. So everything that the IRC does is to the benefit of its members and provide the lessons and gui guidelines for future uh, changes. Next slide. Embedded in the IRC is a funding strategy um, that includes one of uh, jointly monitoring the programs and projects and informing um, investments, providing a diversity of perspectives on the activities, facilitating new design of funding instruments, ensuring that there is equity among the members, uh, including the funders, facilitating and capturing research and innovation priorities, and of course, facilitating centralized calls and of course, forming research alliances as and when they uh, are needed. Next slide. I'm not going to touch on sustainability because the next discussion is going to focus on sustainability, but inherent in the IRC, we have paid, have paid attention to some elements of sustainability that the founding members and the members of the IRC consortium themselves and their commitment will be a, a, an instrument of uh, ensuring sustainability, that the, the members will commit resources so they own the IRC uh, equally by all, that the FNSSA roadmap uh, will remain the, uh, one of the priorities of collaboration between the EU and the EU um, beyond the, the current time frame. And that there is buy-in of funders um, and member states to the IRC, and that the IRC will continue to demonstrate that it continues to add value uh, in supporting the high-level policy dialogue. So inherent in the IRC, we are already anticipating the sustainability issues. And I think the discussion that will follow uh, will delve more into the practicality of the sustainable uh, of the sustainability of the IRC. So this is the last bit that I would like to look is the membership. So how do you become a member and what what are the criteria? Um, that you are a legal entity willing to share resources, and that you are you are supportive of inclusive membership with equal opportunity in decision making and that you are ready to pay a minimum contribution uh, as a fee. And of course, there are benefits because you, as a member, you are able to easily find partners in the area that you are working in. Um, you'll be sharing information and ideas um, across. You also have value for money um, because if you know what's going on, you're able to invest better 
and of course uh, have a higher impact of the work that you, you're doing. Um, there are, of course, obligations um, to contribute to the FNSSA roadmap to have greater coordination and efficiency, contribute to the bi-regional and bi-continental activities, and of course, be committed to long-term engagements, perhaps beyond five years. We're also anticipating um, associated members who may not pay fees, but can also participate as observers. So the IRC includes all the R&I actors, researchers, academia, funders, policymakers, startups, private sector, um, women and youth groups, farmers organizations and farmers, and maybe a whole lot more. But this is the space um, within which the, the IRC or the FNSC is looking at. Today, we have um, about 50 IRC members, 40% from European countries and 60% from African countries. If you look at the next slide, if you look at the um, different sectors, you see that for obvious reason, we have a lot more um, researchers and academia than any other. So the big task we have is to try and find a lot more membership in the other areas because if we need to really transform and scale, we need to have a good membership across the different categories. Um, there is a next slide that gives um, a list, but I'll jump that because I want to just look at the spread. Next slide, okay. So this shows the spread of where you find the IRC signatories when the IRC was launched, it was launched with 29 signatories at the close of the Lipo FNSSA project. We had 40 members. Currently, we have about 50 members. I know there are other members who are contemplating to sign. And so we're hoping that going from here, we're going to have uh, more members. And there is a, a D group that the members are being managed on. So once you're a member, you are in a community of practice and you have a platform to engage. So how to join? Uh, the IRC is very simple. Um, there is a link that I put there. You click the link and you download the IRC declaration and then you will write uh, to the contact uh, me in Farah and then um, it will be processed um, if you have all the um, criteria um, that we have listed. You'll be processed as a signature. When the operation, uh, the implementation of the IRC starts, there is a process of translating or transferring the signatories to become full members. Again, if you, um, I, my colleague at the back has um, a number of the declarations. So if you are interested, uh, he, he can help you with that. Otherwise, you just link and you get uh, um, to the declaration and you can sign. Before I end, Mr. Chair, I would like to acknowledge those who have made this to happen. Um, all the members of the Leaf for FNSSA partners, 35 partners across Africa and Europe, they work very hard to bring us to this point. And I think I, I owe it a duty to acknowledge them and to acknowledge even new members that have joined the consortium to bring us to the operationalization phase awaiting the season. So thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Irene, for drafting the big picture and also for calling actually to the audience in house and also remote uh, for signing up. Um, there are certainly there's a, certainly a lot of food for discussion for for the panel. Maybe in summary, I want to pick uh, on two points. Um, the uh, IRC also as a platform for co-funding. You mentioned uh, the Bakri and FOSC, uh, two instruments of Horizon 2020. 
which allowed us actually to top up with commission funding, the funding from EU and AU member states. So two thirds of funding coming from EU member states and one third the top up from the commission. And such uh, funding tools, uh, such funders networks like Libacri and Frosk are very valuable networks also for funding activities of IRC. So uh, continuing such funders networks, I think giving them a frame in IRC would be an important element. And maybe the second point, um, certainly uh, the IRC is a very valuable um, platform for in-depth collaboration on thematic uh, priorities. Laxta Haidas is developing vaccines. Uh, this is certainly a next step and can be discussed uh, further to what extent soil, agroecology, food system transformation, maybe nutrition, working together, let's say, of, on in-depth thematic working groups with a specific target, the IRC would be the platform. And you, you also outlined, I mean, from um, that we need to know what we know, actually, I mean, to get an overview of all the knowledge. And this leads us to our next speaker, actually. Um, we need to um, be aware, actually, of um, the <coughs> valuable insights uh, which uh, the 500 projects um, have uh, uh, have developed. And um, our next speaker, Professor Ioannis Dimitriou, was behind the leap for FNSSA or one of the uh, contributors or one of the major contributors to the leap for FNSSA database, which is already now a very valuable tool of showing the wealth of uh, EU AU collaborative projects. And uh, this will certainly, uh, with the IRC, take uh, next steps into um, real uh, knowledge uh, platforms. So uh, I would like to introduce uh, Professor Ioannis Dimitru. He is an associate professor at the Swedish University of Agriculture Sciences and a senior research advisor at SLU's Vice Chancellor's Office, responsible for international programs with low and middle income countries. He has been involved in several EU and nationally funded agriculture research for development projects, with the most recent examples being Leap for FNSA and Desira Lift. He was recently appointed Vice President of the European Alliance for on Agricultural Knowledge for Development um, Agrinatur, within Agrinatura and Agrinatura's business unit. His research focuses on designing productive systems with food and biomass crops while achieving a minimal environmental impact, including recycling of different nutrient-rich waste. He, will, he has been working with the science policy interface to support the implementation of smart innovation in agriculture, contributing to the sustainable transformation of food systems. Yeah. Dimitro is the author of more than 100 peer review articles, a member of several PhD examination committees, and an organizer of PhD courses, courses at SLU and partner universities. Thank you very much, Johannes, that you are still with us. I mean, we are behind schedule, so it's uh, great that you uh, um, had the patience actually to stay with us, and we are um, keen to hear your speech. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Hans-Jörg, and thanks uh, to the organizers that invited me to present uh, this presentation about the IRC Knowledge Management Platform, some ideas, let's say, that we have, but we would like to test with you as well. I don't know if you hear me well, uh, so we can continue. Yes, please, uh, we can hear you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, you made the introduction, has Yerk, so I'm not going to say so much more about myself, but I just want to mention that uh, this presentation is also on behalf of uh, all Leap for FNSSA members and also of other partners that we are uh, designing or thinking together about the continuation, let's say, of the efforts to support the IRC. And the reason for this is that 
Uh, my presentation is going to be about where we are at the moment when it comes to the FNSSA knowledge management uh, platform that we have done some things, what we plan to do, but also where we want to be after, let's say, four or five years. And that's not entirely up to me or the colleagues that work with supporting the IRC. So it's mostly or actually entirely up to the IRC members. So I urge all of you now to think together with us if we are thinking correctly when it comes to the, to the knowledge management ideas that we have. And some of the things have been already mentioned. So I also thank the two previous speakers talking about uh, the foresight studies, um, on uh, food system transformations, but also the operational issues of the IRC. So uh, I, I will start by saying that uh, some, some things about the fragmentation of program stakeholders and knowledge. Yes, that is the case. It's one of the main things that uh, um, I always get surprised about. Uh, people do not know what the others are doing, although we are working in the same fields, let's say. And this is something that uh, needs to change if we want to go, let's say, steps ahead. There are, of course, several relevant organizations that work with the question on food and nutrition security and sustainable agriculture or the food system transformation. They tend to have their own knowledge management systems with varying structures and functions. Some of them are more, let's say, focusing on the spreading of information. Uh, some of them uh, are focusing more on uh, uh, dissemination and so on and so on. Uh, some examples, are actually the examples that we are already working with uh, in order to include, let's say, their knowledge management systems or their channels, let's say, or the platforms, their own platforms, uh, together with uh, the IRCs in the future. Um, for instance, the ECGRC, Knowledge Center for Global Food and Nutrition Security, the Africa Knowledge Platform, and the Capacity for Development, uh, Capacity for Dev uh, um, Forum that is mostly a uh, DGIMPA uh, funded projects. We have FARA with their Knowledge Management and Outreach Initiative using the D groups. We have the CGIR, the Performance and Results Management Framework that they have developed that we are uh, also discussing on how to work together. There is a more general aid portals, including also research and uh, innovation activities, the uh, IATA D portal, development portal with a lot of information. And I'm sure you, are, you know many more, let's say, but the question is, um, they are all claim, let's say, and in most of the times it is correct that uh, public access is uh, is there, is for free. Uh, it is about knowledge sharing, and some of uh, the knowledge uh, platforms, uh, including ours, say that it is easy to use. Allow me to doubt about that. In some cases, it's that easy to use, but we are all trying to make it easy to use. But what sometimes I miss is. Um, the learning environments. Okay, we do have the information there, but how does that allow, let's say, the different stakeholders to, to learn something and also develop, let's say, the knowledge? And I, I come back to that, and I think uh, uh, the first speaker mentioned that because um, one of the outcomes of the last AU EU minist agri ministerial uh, meetings, uh, late June in Rome, was that any kind of uh, collaboration, let's say, between AU and EU, including the IRC, needs to be adapted to the AQS concept, let's say. And if I try to make, to use, let's say, a, a simple definition of the AQS is that. Uh, putting together, let's say, the different actors and sources of knowledge and their interactions that will allow the co-production of new knowledge and innovation. So how to take the existing knowledge, if we now found it, the relevant one, and create something out of it. And I think this is what is going to guide, let's say, the knowledge platform uh, of the IRC for the next years when we develop this. Uh, we have made some first efforts, as uh, Hans Jerk also mentioned and Irene previously, within the Leap for FNSA project. 
uh, it is a huge task to find the right information. First of all, to find all the information, but then to find the right information. There have been a lot of projects, uh, let's say funded, uh, completed, uh, or, sorry, or uh, recently going on. We need to find, analyze, aggregate, and report this uh, relevant information. We need to adjust it to the requested, uh, let's say, form by the different kinds of stakeholders. I dare to say that Leap for FNSSA has been mostly focusing on uh, the decision or the policy makers, let's say the decision makers on the higher level and also probably the researchers. We have not managed to reach so many farmers probably or the private sector and I will come back to that. So, but some first efforts have been made on how to find the right information and how to present it. Some examples or some tools that we have at place that we are planning to hopefully develop very soon is the FNSA project database. And I will only give you some slides because this is, again, um, easy to find and use uh, for yourselves and by yourselves. Uh, just uh, Google Leap for FNSA, you will end up at the still um, operating Leap for FNSA uh, web page, and there you can see a window of the uh, with the FNSA project database. At the moment, as some mentioned, about 500 projects. There are more to come. Funded uh, mostly by EU and AU, um, including uh, different categories, categorizations by theme, uh, and also started lately to include European nationally funded projects together with uh, African partners. So bit of a different kinds of uh, funding sources in there that we plan to develop a bit more. Uh, again, uh, indicatively, just to show how, how a project description looks like, you can find, let's say, on the, on the left side, some general information on the project, some more information that you can find about the project itself when it comes to the website. There are also documents uh, in some projects uh, connected with outcomes and outputs of the different of the different projects themselves, all 460 ones. Uh, one of the most popular uh, things that the visitors of the website uh, going to is the projects per country. So we have managed to put uh, together, let's say, maps with uh, the different projects coming, uh, uh, operating in the different countries. So people are actually, after some time that they go around, we can see that they go into the countries and try to see how many projects are in different countries. I think in this case, the Tanzania example is not uh, updated. I think it's many more now. Um, one thing that we managed also to do also uh, preparing to support the IRC as such is that we put together the list of the partners participating in the project. So now we have about, well, more than 2,000 Partners, let's say, that have been active or still active, let's say, in the different projects. I think it's a good base to reach them from there, let's say, in order to get them more interested into the IRC. There are many private actors there as well, besides the different uh, university and higher education institutions. You can see on the left the type of organizations that have been working with the, with the project. So we can see... Also bearing in mind uh, Irene's uh, last um, uh, figure with the members uh, included that there's a dominance of uh, higher education institutions. Well, yes, uh, as, as she said, we need to be a bit more active on attracting the interest of the private companies, let's say. And besides the database, we've been uh, also trying to, to use um, uh, the knowledge extraction pipeline system, uh, which is an artificial intelligence text mining machine learning uh, tool in order to use the advanced text mining and, and artificial intelligence technologies to get, let's say, the information that we need and create the outputs that are requested by the different decision makers. Uh, in that case, uh, you can see on the right side, there are a lot of figures that are coming out from there. And I think that example has, uh, let's say, has been ordered by uh, a funding organization that wanted to know a bit more about a specific uh, 
a specific theme that has been funded, let's say, during the last 10 years. So we are all also doing that and we will try to develop this a bit more in the future. Uh, so what next? Uh, some considerations for the IOC knowledge management and learning platform. And I add the learning because I think it is very, very important to to keep in mind that we need that and not only, let's say, managing the information, but also creating information in the IRC. Um, well, whatever we produce, it has to be based on stakeholder needs. And this is where it comes. Uh, my first comment that uh, it is not us that we will make these functionalities. It has to come from the IRC members. Uh, I think uh, any kind of uh, knowledge management and learning platform needs to be open and accessible and user-friendly. There's no doubt about that. Uh, we need to continuously update this. It's a lot of, let's say, one month behind it, and we need to make the platform uh, semi-automatic or in automatic modes with some quality assurance in order to be also sustainable for the future. We need to put quite a lot of effort, again, uh, knowledge for brokerage to create the right knowledge in the right format at the right time. Uh, and this is easy to say, but more difficult to do if there's no, uh, let's say, feedback from the ones that order the knowledge. So we need to work very close together with the other components of the IRC. Uh, we need to connect, and we have already started to connect and synergize with other KMS uh, knowledge management system initiatives. Uh, I will mention some of them, the GRC, the CGIR, but there are also others, and they've been implied also by the previous speakers, that maybe it's not only Europe or the US that work, let's say, with uh, with knowledge on, on, on that particular um, theme, the FNSSA. Um, the Project databases of the FAO, the CGIR, the World Bank, the USAID, we need to think how to deal with this, not only to connect uh, with them, but also try to use their, let's say, um, knowledge in there in order to produce something that will make sense for ourselves. Private sector uh, research initiatives have been uh, quite a lot and are very relevant. The question is how easy it is to attain them and how easy it is to use them. Uh, we need to find a way to come closer in general with the private sector. Of course, they will come only if they see, let's say, something that is something for them. So we need to work very much uh, or, or with, uh, with the different tools that we have, let's say, for them as well. To connect the actual results to published material and references in order to actually uh, 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 grasp the outcomes, not only information about what has been done, but what has been found as well. And this is connected also to mail exercises uh, that we will work closer together in, in hopefully a new initiative that will come soon. And then uh, one of the things uh, that I think uh, you, Hans Jörg, mentioned as well about the themes, what kind of themes, what kind of categorizations, let's say, will be at place and how they will synergize uh, in order to make the best synergies that we can that we can get. I think it's also a matter of the engagement of the different members of the IRC, but we need to find ways to 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 use the the knowledge management and learning platform in such a way that will create, let's say, the synergies uh, in a much more visible way. And of course, the sustainability. There will be a, a whole section of of that about the IRC, but. We need also to think about the sustainability of the management tools, let's say, that we produce. So I will stop here. And again, uh, I think what is going to be new in the new phases of uh, putting together the knowledge management uh, and learning platform is how do we find the right information and create the new knowledge that is uh, required, let's say, for, for an AKIS um, uh, perspective, let's say, that we need to have in the future. So with this... Uh, again, a, a potential uh, function of how to support the IRC is here. You can see that the knowledge management, of course, is one of the central parts of it, but it needs to be connected to the networking and stakeholder engagement, but also to the to the coordination, let's say, of uh, of the of the IRC. So we're looking forward to work together with the other partners, let's say, on that. So with this, uh, thank you very much for your time and for the opportunity to have
to talk a bit more and share some ideas and also hopefully you sharing some ideas with us on the knowledge platform of the IRC. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Johannes, for your forward-looking uh, presentation building on successes of the past, like the project database, which has been very useful in ma many instances. Certainly, uh, looking at your knowledge model, you are aware that you are in a very competitive and fast-developing uh, field with language models like Chat GPT or Aleph Alpha, which are actually fast developing, but maybe it's something also for innovative startup thinking on the African and the European side to make such uh, knowledge and such uh, dynamics useful actually for for the IRC. So we are now um, at the end of the session one, and I would uh, invite you all to applaud our speakers again of the first uh, session, so Johannes uh, um, and Jim and Irene. <laughs> and now we are moving uh, to uh, session two and um, uh, we will actually start with a panel discussion uh, where we will look at the sustainability of the IRC. So the various dimensions which have been already mentioned in the initial speeches, so like financing, uh, maybe even innovative financing, thematic orientation, we can take Star Idas as an example. And we would all, let's say we will have a panel which will look from the individual and the institutional perspectives on sustainability. And I would like to invite Irene actually to take over as a uh, panel uh, chair. Irene, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, let me quickly bring the panel to the table. I already have uh, you, so please stay there. I'll just introduce you very quickly. On this panel, um, we're going to focus on sustainability. That's the, the elephant in the room. I call on, uh, of course, Dr. Monica Indonba, or Indonba, am I correct? She's the principal uh, scientific officer at the African Union Commission and holds a PhD in geography and has previously worked um, with the IITA and, and, of course, with also WADA as um, Africa Rice. Um, and then um, she moved to the Center for International Forestry uh, Research as a senior scientist and later as a coordinator of the Tropical Forest and Climate Change Adaptation and currently works at the African Union Commission Department of Education, Science and Technology and Innovation as the principal scientific officer. Next um, on our panel, I have Dr. Agria Gumia been um, introduced um, Severally today, um, she is executive director of FARA and holds PhD degrees in geomatics, specializing in GIS and remote sensing from the University of Melbourne. He has 25 years of professional experience, um, including uh, good work at the World Agroforestry Center and then later to the Forum for Agricultural Research in Africa and his expertise um, uh, work spans the entire continent. And over the past years, he has focused on the deployment of spatial tools in the development of work towards improving food security, incomes, and resilience to climate change induced shocks. Uh, we also are pleased to have on our panel, Ms. Antonella Zona, she is the Research Policy Officer at the European Commission, Directorate General for Agriculture and Rural Development, and she co-chairs the Africa-EU FNSS Working Group. Antonella is in charge of fostering international cooperation in agricultural research and innovation. She is part of the team responsible uh, for agricultural forestry, 
and rural research under the EU research programs and providing the secretariat for the Horizon Europe RNI mission. Uh, so a sole deal for Europe. Antonella has been working for the European Commission since 1993 in rural development, agricultural markets, outlook and analysis, direct uh, support to farmers, European innovation partners for agricultural productivity and sustainability, foresight and impact assessment. She holds a master's degree in advanced European studies from the European College of Paris. Welcome, um, Antonella. I have another panel member, but online. Um, I don't know whether uh, Dr. Prudence Makura, um, who is uh, works at the National uh, Research Foundation as director of overseas. Uh, is she online? Can you? Confirm yes. so that I go to the next. Yes, I'm online, Irene, okay, but I can't can make my video on. She, oh, she, in, 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 his in her capacity as uh, Overseas Collaborative Grants and Initiative uh, Director, uh, she's responsible for advancing and managing all bilateral and multilateral partnership between South Africa and Europe, Asia, Americas, and the Gulf region. Uh, and she is also um, responsible for the bilateral co cooperation for other African and Middle Eastern countries, um, including the AU, SADAC, uh, COMDAV, ADEA, and AAU. Ms. Makura um, has also worked as a project officer for investors, a project manager for investors in South Africa and manager for the Council of Higher Education, researcher for the Human Resources, um, Human Science Research Council, and the Center for Social Research at the University of Johannesburg. She holds a master's degree in industrial sociology and a PhD in the management of science and technology. Our next uh, person on the panel, uh, unfortunately indicated that she is unwell but she has sent a brief. So uh, Miss Gina uh, Tusdale, uh, who is the uh, president of the YPART as a young professional for agriculture uh, research and development, um, is not able to join us, but she sent us something and we applaud her for her uh, inputs. Um, before joining YPART, uh, she was the federal agriculture policy officer at the German Rural Youth Association. And as a Fulbright researcher at the Humboldt University of Berlin, she focused on youth involvement in agricultural policy and was a former president um, of the International Association of Agriculture and Related Sciences students. A graduate of the Global Oriented Iowa State and Penn State Universities with MSc in Plant Pathology and International Agriculture and Development. Our last panel speaker, you see online, is Mr. Michael Sudakasa, the CEO of the African Fertilizer and Agribusiness Partnership. Um, as, um, as is also the founder and chairman of the Africa Business uh, Group and also the AUS commercial attorney by training. Uh, I lived, traveled and worked in 50 countries around the world and is an author of several publications. Um, he um, has a number of publications that I probably jump uh, because of time, but a lot of it includes element on, on markets as well as on um, agribusiness. He's a member of the University of Michigan Provost's Advisory Committee and sits on the advisory board of the African Center for the Study of the United States of the University of Richard Strand and the African Center, no, sorry, and also the chair of the advisory board 
of the African Studies Center of the University of Michigan. He holds uh, a BA degree from the University of Michigan and a JD degree from Harvard Law School. So colleagues, this is the, the, the pedigree of panel members we have to discuss the issue of sustainability of the IRS. For each of them, I'm going to just pose a question or two and they will directly move to answer those questions so that we're a bit more pointed um, in this discussion. And then after that, we will, the rest of the period will be for engagement between uh, the, panel, uh, the, the audience and the panel. So, to Dr. Monica, the AUC has over the years cooperated with the European Commission on Research and Innovation on FNSS. Now, as part of this cooperation, the AUC has managed research grants that has spearheaded important AU-EU partnerships among research scientists. What important lessons have we learned from these? Which related AU policies will make direct input to the sustainability of the IRC in the long term? And how can we position AU member states to join the IRC and make financial inputs? We'll also be grateful if you can give us your view of what you see the vision of success of the IRC. Thank you very much, Irene. Um, I'm going to share just a few of the experiences I have gathered from the 30 years that I have managed the African Union Research Grant Program. Uh, like Irene mentioned, it is a joint collaboration between the European Union and the African Union Commission. Um, I want to start by emphasizing here that right from the onset, you know, we had a clear theory of change. We knew what we wanted and where we were heading to. I think this is one of the areas that a lot of you know uh, institutions and researchers uh, often miss it. So uh, to ensure that uh, one of the objectives that we had was to promote uh, intra-Africa, North South uh, collaboration, uh, research and innovation collaboration, you know, across between the two continents. And then we also decided to have a criteria uh, of um, having a consortia, you know, to run the program. And the that's partnership of minimum of three uh, institutions from two member states. And then we also had the uh, model of uh, 80, uh, funding model of 80 to 20 percent. 80% from the uh, donor and 20%, of course, from uh, from the, the the beneficiaries of the um, of the grant, and this was very key and very important. So, you know, to ensure for us for, uh, as African Union, we wanted to ensure that you know uh, action was taking place in as many locations of the African Union member states as possible because this is what we stand for. So we didn't want a situation whereby just one institution gets the grants and then it sits there in one country. We wanted to trickle it down to as many uh, African countries as we could. And also the 80, 20% model that, you know, that we, we, we established also kind of helped the institutions you know, to be able to meet their own 20% obligations. So you have three research institutions coming together to be able, you know, to put down the 20% that was uh, that was requested or was needed, you know, to get the grant. I wouldn't say that we didn't have challenges. We had quite a number of challenges. And uh, one of the challenges that we had was in terms of maintaining commitment and engagement at the same pace. Different institutions were at different, you know, different pace. And uh, especially when it comes to the differences in procurement rules of the different countries. Uh, we also had uh, a bit of challenges, you know, with um, uh, some institutions 
And I don't know, this we're talking to universities, and I may go to say that, you know, uh, from the experiences that I had, that um, some universities, you know, categorically told us that their, um, their commitment to uh, uh, lecturing and so administrative matters would not permit them to do research. And we had a couple of universities that actually refunded the monitors. We also have some institutions that, you know, just funded, you know, just the whole amount that was given to them was on infrastructure, on vehicles. We had an institution that was six vehicles with the money that was given. And then the question is, I mean, was that a priority? And so we concluded that uh, maybe it was a question of inability to be able to define, uh, you know, an action that could translate to development. And that's where, you know, if private sectors were probably involved, then the beneficiary will know that he is responsible, is responding to the need, you know, of the industry that, you know, uh, uh, that he is working on. Um, now talking about the, the AU uh, policies. Uh, I would like to say here that uh, within the AU system, different sectoral departments has their ministers, ministers for that sector that guide the decisions, continental decisions that relate to that sector. And for us at the Africa, for me in my department of education science and technology, uh, we are guided by the ministers of education, science, and technology. And it is these ministers that actually take decisions for everything that we do on the continent that relates uh, to, to science and technology. Now, speaking about the IRC, you know, where you fit in. The IRC fits more to the ministers in charge of agriculture. But also when you look at the, you know, the research and innovation component of it, then it comes to my department of education, science, and technology. And uh, it's, um, I, I recall that it's at this platform of the ministerial platform that the decision to establish the uh, Education Science and Technology Fund was taken. And this fund is going to be managed by the African Development Bank as a special fund. And to date, we are, it, at least the good news is that the board of the, of the bank have accepted that, you know, uh, they have, um, accepted threshold of 5 million uh, USD as a threshold to kickstart the fund. And thus far, we have two member states, the uh, Malawi and Ghana, that have uh, committed 2 million each. So we're looking for more uh, commitment for other, from other member states. And the African uh, Development Bank is working hard to engage their regional uh, member countries and also bilateral and multilateral uh, uh, partners in you know, order to commit into that fund. So when we make progress in that area, and I, I believe that very soon we're going to have it launched out. Now, is that my last question? Yeah, but just a uh, quick word on your vision. Okay. Vision for the IRC. Well, like I said earlier, uh, for the IRC, I think it will be very important. One of the experiences that we had with the research grant was the fact that most of our research institutions in Africa do not know how to write a competitive research proposal. That was one of the things that we found. I mean, the core research institution, I'm not talking about the CDIR and those that have uh, some kind of you know external uh, connections. So there's need to have a capacity in that area. Why am I saying so? Because if you open up our IRC, you know, to everyone, Africa, most institutions in Africa may be disadvantaged, you know, to be able to compete. Uh, and yeah. And then you spoke about what was the last question? Sorry. Yeah, that was the vision of success. So, so I'll stop there. Thank you very much, um, um, Dr. Monica. We are going to move to um, ask um, Ms. Antonella 
uh, two questions, but because of time, I'm going to put them all together and see that the EC uh, has also worked tirelessly to advance research and innovation cooperation with the AU. And the EC had put forward a number of financing models and, and envelopes um, to um, advance a number of the initiatives. Uh, Horizon Europe is currently providing financing to kickstart the IRC uh, and, and its operationalization process within its, its strategy and of course within the innovation agenda as well, uh, ensuring that the IRC will present the foundation for the agri-food system. From this perspective, how will the IRC be positioned to the EU member states to effectively solicit their membership and financial inputs? Um, from your view, what will be the vision of success? The second element of your question is that um, in June this year, an agricultural ministerial uh, meeting concluded that the IRC should be supported as the principal foundation for a viable agricultural knowledge and innovation system. From your rich experience in the EC and your roles under the Horizon Europe, which services should the IRC operationalize to ensure roles that add value to the development partners quest to achieve impact of r and Yes, thank you, Irene, and I will be brief because uh, we are a bit ahead of schedule, but I want to raise this opportunity um, uh, to um, really highlight the role of the farmers in the IRC, because I think that this is something very important uh, in, uh, I mean, if we look at the sustainability of, of the IRC. Uh, you asked me to uh, maybe build or uh, think about the experience uh, from the European Union side. Naturally, our the last, let's say, seven to eight years in agricultural research in the EU, they show that the uh, that research is as an impact. Research and innovation are impactful and can address challenges if they are really co-managed with the farmers and uh, so in this um, regards both the definition of priorities so what is going to be the subject of the research and here i think uh, i mean in concrete about this uh, priority topics for the IRC, you showed some different working groups that will be uh, organized. And I think that there it is really key to define these priorities together with the end users, which are, I mean, of course, the farmers that we saw, they are, for the moment, they have not been so present. And so there, this is where there is an effort to be made clearly, but then also with other type of uh, end users, I mean, going up to, in the value chain. Um, uh, and also, uh, I think from the European experience highlights the key role of the advisors, extension services in agriculture. Because as you said also in your presentation, Irene, knowledge needs, I mean, the, the outcomes of research, they need often 30 years to go from shelves to the implementation on the ground. But this period, I mean, can be really uh, reduced uh, by far if the, ex if the advisors on the ground they can bring this innovation and adapt it uh, in uh, to, to the local conditions, talking to the end users, which mostly are farmers indeed. So um, this, I, I mean, I would uh, really, I mean, like to maybe focus my message on this uh, need to look and give more uh, space and uh, let's say bring more farmers and advisors representatives into the IRC when defining, for example, the working groups, uh, but also, uh, I mean, in, in the implementation of the projects. Uh, so this is clearly the multi, I mean, what the multi-actor approach is about and uh, the foundation of the ACIS that the ministers for agriculture have mentioned is this, uh, uh, let's say, kind of, uh, I mean, reducing the gap between 
science and practice. And I also would put the foresters among uh, the, the practices um, and, um, and have a kind of, uh, I mean, maybe promote also some kind of peer-to-peer -peer learning because we know that the implementation to, for having an impact of the uh, of research um, we need to have research implemented on the ground and sometimes farmers listen more to their peers to other farmers for uh, uh, bringing about and uh, you know really um, let's say having these the, the, the solutions uh, applying new solutions or really participate in developing these uh, uh, new solutions um, it's uh, then let's maybe look also at the policy making side because this is important for funding uh, both from the EU level and also from the African level and uh, here I uh, I would maybe underline the the need to bring to support evidence evidence based or science based decision making we have for this or in I mean the, the pan up. Uh, network in Africa that we are going to promote. So this brings to closer and uh, yeah, even closer cooperation between the IRC and PANAPS. And uh, I mean, we have similar also networks and uh, tools at the, at the European side. Um, so uh, really multi-actor approach with the development of a skill set for or for the farmers and uh, um, use this uh, huge uh, reservoir of knowledge, which are the, the projects, uh, these uh, 500 projects. Uh, uh, it would uh, be good to maybe know more and have their, uh, um, their findings uh, um, uh, I would say, uh, really um, presented and also in these kind of events. I think this is also, also the, what would bring more the practice and this so by having more impact impact would br will bring sustainability at least this is what we i mean what i would uh, see from uh, the experience uh, in the eu and i will stop here thanks thank you very much uh, Janela. and um, let me quickly ask uh, dr Agri, um from a, a wider uh, partnership uh, perspective FARA has been a number of them, North, South, 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 triangular uh, partnerships. Um, so from that perspective, what are the important lessons that have been learned um, that are pertinent for the sustainability of the IRC? And, and of course, in relation to the priorities, R&I priorities within the context of the FNCC. And of course, um, again, end with your perspective. So maybe the next two minutes. Two minutes, yes. Thank you. I will just then uh, give the bullet points. Um, the lessons from from FARA are that um, a lot of the partnership platforms that we've had were conceived as projects. Um, the IRC, fortunately, is not a project. It's not time-bound. And uh, therefore, the design uh, is sustainability somehow uh, inbuilt. But the key lesson, uh, I think, from what we have uh, seen is that we need to have a credible sustainability strategy right from the beginning. Um, we have examples where um, many examples uh, where uh, the, the project, the partnerships have not been uh, successful because the strategy was not in place. The second point is um, that to ensure that the platform delivers value and remains relevant to its members so that they can continue to be part of it because its sustainability, the way it is designed, depends on the membership are continuing to uh, by it, it, it. Uh, I had some additional points about making the cost of the membership affordable. 
uh, over time, but I'll jump to the next question, um, which is about research and innovation priorities. Um, what elements should research and innovation priorities? Um, the, the key point here is to align that the 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 IRC research and innovation priorities should be aligned with priorities of the two continents. Priorities as expressed in CADA and priorities uh, for uh, the APM, uh, innovation agenda. Presently, we have those priorities uh, expressed uh, through uh, the big initiatives that are, that are out there. Um, I'll jump to the last one. Vision of success. Um, the vision of success, of course, is strengthened uh, cooperation between uh, research and innovation institutions in the two continents, delivering the expected outcomes. And in addition, the IRC model uh, between Africa and Europe being model for cooperation with other regions. Um, and I think the scaling up of the IRC, not to be with Europe only, but with other regions, would be another indicator of success. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Agri, uh, for those points. Um, um, Dr. Makura, again, in two minutes, um, the IRC expects to put forward an innovative financing model and to ensure its sustainability. Based on your experience at the NRF, um, what are the perspectives? What should be the IRC's focus um, in order to leverage funders' interests as members? Thank you so much, um, Irene. Um, I will be very brief because I'm extremely hard pressed for time on my end. Um, and if I may be excused after my contribution, it will be appreciated. So um, when you uh, presented, Irene, on the IRC, there was a slide where you indicated the um, participating members that have signed to be, uh, or members that have signed to be, um, to participate in the IRC, and there was um, very few uh, that represented the funders um, in your slides. And I think uh, it is not actually too surprising uh, to see that. And um, for me, the main challenge when it comes to um, funders coming together is the is the fact that you know funders are highly they are a highly differentiated um, uh, grouping of stakeholders. Um, so they have different um they have different approaches to funding. Um, they have different um working mechanisms, they have different systems, and that at, even when you have the same type of uh, funders within themselves, they also have different capacities and they are at different uh, developments. And I think it's also part of the reason um or a part of what stimulated the question, one of the questions that I saw on the chat uh, there from a colleague from uh, Burkina Faso about uh, managing the different capacities um, of the funders, because it is an issue. Funders are highly differentiated. And uh, for me, I think um, if the IRC um, is to actually attract funders, uh, there's a, that few important elements that needs to be in place. One of those is to ensure that although this are a group of funders, it's like a network of funders, that we have to have flexibility and allowance to have different alliances of funders within the network itself. And not within the platform, but within the network of funders. There has to be that allowance for different um, alliances of different um, uh, funders and these alliances uh, can be temporary alliances that allow uh, funders to come in and out as they as, as they please, and also um, um, the IRC generally, um, Irene, is a very very good idea. 
um, because there is a need for this high level systematic um, overarching long-term coordination process, um, but we need to ensure that um, it works for all the different type of stakeholders that are involved. And I think that um, um, for funders, for example, um, if we don't build in regular um, feedback mechanisms to funders, then it becomes very difficult for funders to participate. And what I mean by that is that um, this this was this point that I'm trying to put across also links to what uh, Antonella uh, indicated about evidence-based research. So as much as the funders are regrouping on their own, they need to interface very strongly with the researchers, with the innovators, the farmers and so forth, because that feedback mechanism is very important to make um, relevant and targeted funding decisions for funders. So it's very important that we ensure that that um, uh, communication, that line of communication um, is, is actually very clear within the IRC. And also what is important is the issue of the, the monitoring and the evaluation of the funders network. And this is not about monitoring and evaluation of the platform. I know this has already been taken care of, but it's very important that we ensure that there are frameworks for funders for funders alliances and uh, or for funders networks within the platform itself. It's very important to have that. And if I look at, for example, if I look at um, the public funders, like the public national or sub-national uh, funders, um, they use public resources. And because they use public resources, they are bound by official administrative regimes. And this, this requires that they have the flexibility uh, and, and the flexibility to be heard when it comes to their obligations, when it comes to their requirements, when it comes to their limitations. And this needs to be carefully dealt with uh, within the IRC. So for me, at the core of it is the flexibility that is important and its inclusivity that is very important. And then just the last thing that I want to say is that we must be very careful of how we use certain concepts, especially when we speak to funders. For example, uh, in one of your, your slides, Irene, you indicated like um, the fact that, uh, you know, the IRC will have like centralized calls. I'm just giving one example. The IRC will have centralized calls. You know, that just that wording, for example, is very problematic when you talk to a funder and you talk about a centralized call. You know, so we need to be careful because there's different understanding of what centralized calls mean. And, and it comes with a little bit of um, lack of flexibility, if you put it that way. But if you talk about differentiated calls, uh, that are centrally coordinated or centrally managed. Now, there's a there's a different perspective altogether. So, same sometimes same concepts may mean different things to different stakeholders. So, we should we should just be careful when we approach, uh, like for example, funders, what type of concepts um uh, we are using. Um, but Irene, at the core of it, from uh, from my experience. Uh, we need to allow for flexibility and we need to allow for inclusivity when, if we want to attract more funders uh, into the IRC platform. I think I'll leave it at that for now, Irene. Thank you so much, um, um, Dr. Makura, for that. Um, I think the last um, person to give us uh, thought is uh, Mr. Stakasa on the inclusion of private sector because this is something that everybody tells us when we talk about the IRC. So in two minutes, um, your thoughts on the inclusion of private sector, what type of private sector, and what's your vision of success? Thank you, uh, and good evening uh, to all. Uh, I think that um, it is definitely valuable to include uh, the private sector. Uh, I am based in the agriculture uh, sector and particularly uh, as AFAP, we work with colleagues who are in the inputs end uh, of the, the food system. Um, 
I mentioned in, in, in an earlier conversation that we had that in particular, um, the move within the fertilizer industry to reduce the carbon footprint in production uh, is an area where um, it's ripe for greater collaboration. Uh, so too is an area around um, the development of drought resistant seed. Um, so these are two, two areas. I think what, what makes the IRC attractive is that there's a need and a growing focus uh, within the private sector to form closer relationships with research institutions. Um, as we talk about, and, and as an organization, AFAP is involved uh, with the development and planning and hopefully implementation soon of the African Fertilizer and Soil Health Summit. Uh, so institutions that are uh, like APNI, the African Plant Nutrition Institute, that are experts uh, in soil health. How can we work with them, um, again, to help promote within particularly the, the smallholder community that we work, better understanding of, of, of good practice relate, as it relates to soil health, of uh, products and technology <clears throat> that can help improve yields. Um, and so an earlier speaker talked about, I think, the importance of, of research that can be commercialized. Uh, and, and I think um, that should be part, doesn't need to be all of, of the, the focus, um, because I think that there's, uh, when you talk about innovation, um, a critical role for um, the private sector to play. Um, where those successes can be shown, there's also then capital that can be mobilized from the private sector in the form of investment. Um, I think it's also key in the approach to the EU that on the continental side, we explore uh, potential matching investment from uh, African institutions and then the private sector uh, stands out as one institution or one body of, of a collection of institutions that can play a role. Uh, our headquarters is based in, in South Africa, although we're active in uh, nine countries in different in three regions of the continent. Um, but in the South African context, we have uh, larger commercial entities that in, in many instances have foundations that make investment themselves. Um, we have uh, high net worth CEOs of companies. Again, and, and from our vantage point, if the private sector is a part of the initiative, uh, we reach out to those, those institutions and talk about uh, a research agenda that should be at least in part um, funded by, by African institutions and, and the private sector can play a role. Um, the value in that context is that uh, when one develops new innovation, um, issues around intellectual property come up. Uh, and so you, you would like to be uh, an investor in that process so that you can actually um, say, well, I, I get to use the, the IP as well. Uh, increasingly, um, the integration of renewable energy uh, in agriculture, for processing, for um, assisting with uh, water reticulation through water pumping, drip irrigation, et cetera. These are all areas, and I know that there's a parallel body that's looking at renewable energy broadly, uh, but in the agricultural context, when we talk about transformation of, of raw produce into a value-added product, this is critical as well. And so, um, from a, a theory of change, or at least a, a vision of success, I'll put it that way. Um, the idea would be that the private sector could, and we, we, as AFAP again earlier this year, held a series of regional public-private dialogues. Uh, in the one that we held in, in Ghana, uh, the, the, the theme of a public-private research dialogue emerged because uh, the colleagues who joined us there from the research sector felt that they too 
benefited and had something to contribute. Uh, and so this, to me, pretends to be potentially a platform where you have the public sector, uh, which plays an outsized role in terms of, of agricultural development uh, on the continent. You have the private sector who is growing, uh, the domestic private sector, and also uh, investments from, from global participants is growing. Um, I think driven by the fact that there's a recognition that uh, we're moving towards in 2030, a $1 trillion uh, African agricultural market. Um, and then you, you also have the research colleagues uh, who are at the forefront of innovation and development. And as I said, particularly, um, we need climate adaptation innovation um, to help us grapple with um, the impact of climate change. Uh, and, and as uh, I mentioned in terms of the Soil Health Summit, um, we need to be able to better understand how to maximize um, the quarter of the, the world's arable land that is in Africa, uh, but also has many challenges um, when you talk about uh, the soil health. So, you know, this is what uh, motivates an organization like ours to, to want to, to support. Um, and we believe that there, there, there are others around the continent that definitely would see value uh, in this structure as well. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I do acknowledge that uh, Miss uh, Gina Tesdell um, being unwell, but she sent something small uh, to be read on her behalf. But because of time, we're going to include it um, in the summary. Um, I would not have time. There's been very rich um, um, inputs and interventions from all the panel members. I want to now hand over to the chair so that the open discussion to, uh, be done to close the, the side event. Thank you very much. So um, I would I crave your indulgence, give our, our panel members a round of applause so that they can take their seats. Yeah, thank you, um, Irene. Um, actually, we have foreseen interaction with you, the audience, um, facilitated by Jelle. Uh, here, actually, um, on site, so facilitated by Jelle Maas, and um, online, actually, facilitated by Anti Audio. And as Jelle is stepping to the podium, I would ask Anti um, to look at the chat and uh, maybe uh, already outline the elements of the chat. Anti, are you online? So, um, Yes. Um, then maybe we just go um, in the interest of time to the audience here. Um, Yeli, would you take the um, those who wish to ask a question or make comments? But please be brief. Just summarize in uh, in two sentences what you would like to say. There's already a microphone coming. The gentleman up there, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, very briefly, I think it's uh, an extremely exciting initiative for strengthening cooperation between the EU and, uh, and uh, the EU. Well, uh, my assumption is that uh, it, 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 the, the purpose is really to increase uh, impact, uh, which is at some level. But uh, I see a problem, uh, uh, first of all, with the patient. And also, I think uh, Natalia also expressed it on uh, the, the issue of uh, supply and demand. And uh, I put supply research, innovation, and, uh, so on, of services. 
and demand, which starts from extension and from organization and so on. There's, a, there's certainly a big mismatch between that. It is going to affect the overall impact of, of the initiative if you don't balance it. And my proposal is one, I don't know why the reason that, or I don't know why, why it happens. But if it is so happens that because those are business clients are not very active participants, usually, and players in such high level activities. So maybe we have to to conduct just like we do other things, sort of affirmative, proactive, uh, and uh, and purposeful action to bring in the missing link in all these activities, so that they are active players and we see better impact in the, in the whole initiative. So thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for the uh, next uh, lady in, in the yellow dress. Please uh, state uh, also who you are and where you're from. Thank you. I'm um, Flora Shadai. I'm professor of food science and nutrition from National University of Agriculture in Benin. It was very interesting to follow all this uh, presentation. I have some comments and one question. Uh, the comments are more related to uh, the presentation on uh, agricultural transformation of the Af African food system. So we have seen that there are a lot of issue now that has uh, increased the inflation in most countries. And also in IRC, there are many, many countries that are involved, both from the north, northern part of the world and the southern part. So how best do we improve the resilience of local population in such a contest in which many countries have different geopolitical issues. I was uh, also sh shocked, almost shocked, by some declaration from Mrs. Monica, who was saying that some university were not willing to perform research. And even some uh, return the money to them. I was really wondering if these universities are truly from Africa. As comment, I wanted to add that for IRC, co-creation process is key because the number of institutions that are gathered together in IRC don't have, uh, may not have the same priorities and may not have the, the same uh, emergency issues. So co-creation uh, has been used already by IRC, but it's important also uh, to for sustainability and subsequent monitoring evaluation and the good theory of change are also very important. So I want to stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I think um, Antonella, do you feel that you can answer on these questions of these two people or? Yep. I, I can certainly comment. I mean, uh, I think I, I'm, I'm fully in line with the comment of the first participant. I mean, it's uh, uh, clearly I mean, the, the need for a proactive action to, to bring farmers more into the, uh, the IRC, I, I think it's essential. It was uh, yeah, one also of my main point. And uh, what I can add is that uh, the experience in the European Union in the last uh, seven, eight years is that farmers are really, uh, I mean, if they see an advantage, of course, for them, because they need to, I mean, in participating in activities, in research activities like in the IRC, 
as a cost, of course, uh, for them, maybe more for farmers than for researchers, I would say. But then once they see that they, are, they can benefit because they find concrete solutions for their everyday problems, uh, then they really do participate and they have their own organizations and they can uh, they have fundings. So I would like to bring a very positive experience from the EU side. So I, I would really recommend, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, being proactive and I think that they will with farmers, uh, um, advisors, foresters, and their organizations. Uh, and I think that this will bring uh, in the good fruit. And uh, well, how, how to improve resilience, I think what I take from the second uh, uh, intervention, um, uh, it's a complex question, of course, how to improve. but. Um, from the studies that I have seen, and because also from, by the way, from by Wageminger University, there were specific studies about resilience in how to improve resilience in agriculture and in agri-food systems. I, I think the the reply is quite com. It's also I mean you cannot you don't have a simple reply, but basically the, it's the multi-actor approach. Is the fact of having a good mapping of those who are involved uh, uh, in the system, having a system approach and uh, adapting the reaction of each part so that they can be, so that the system as a whole can be stronger after the shock, after the, uh, after the crisis. This is how resilience works. So, I mean, I'm, a, I'm, um, I'm aware this is quite a theoretical <laughs> reply at this stage, but I think I, I cannot uh, have a, a more specific one about resilience. Yeah, this is what I could say. Yeah. Thank you very much, Antonella. Before I uh, take the, the other questions in the, in the room, uh, I, I will come to you in a minute. Uh, I would first like to ask uh, Antti, are there any uh, questions from the online panel because there, there were about 50 people uh, participating. But Antti, it, are you already unmuted? Indeed, indeed. I just received the unmuting right. So a pleasure to uh, be with all of you today. And I would like to kindly thank the organizers uh, for the brilliant event and uh, all the speakers for their uh, great contributions to the discussion, interesting discussion. And uh, so my name is Antti Altio from the Finnish University Partnership for International Development, aka UNIPID, which is a network of nine Finnish universities uh, coordinated uh, by the University of Helsinki. And uh, to the, the online discussion has, today has been uh, quite vivid, and there are several uh, questions posed by the uh, by the um, online participants. And uh, there, uh, the uh, first one on my list uh, was uh, from Francois Stepman. Uh, and uh, it is how will IRC contribute to the post Malapo uh, KDP negotiations? And um, I could also uh, take a f maybe read a few other ones here. So, um, uh, Jibril uh, Yonli has uh, uh, asked, uh, stated, Irene, thank, thank you for the presentation. Since funders do not have the same financial capacities depending uh, on the budget allocated by each government, uh, how does IRC intend to ensure equity? between members and um, mm, then um, uh, if I take a third question um, I, uh, also by uh, uh, Jibril um, Yonli, since the working language uh, slash collaboration and the selection of competitive projects are done in English, Aren't countries that don't have English as an official language marginalized? Or since the working language for collaboration and the selection of competitive projects is English, aren't countries that don't have English as an official language marginalized or disadvantaged in uh, the IRC? 
and uh, um, hopefully my uh, co-facilitator, uh, 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 Dr. Uh, uh, Petronella Ch uh, Ch uh, Chaminuka will soon be able also to um, unmute herself so, um, so that uh, we can give her also the floor. But these were the three first questions from the um, online participants to the uh, panelists and the speakers of today. Over to you, Je Jelle. Thank you, Antti, uh, for this uh, online contribution from Finland. Considering the questions, uh, Irene, uh, are you willing uh, uh, to answer this question? Because there are much about the organization and about the, how we actually do foresee our organization on, for instance, other languages. Uh, and stuff. Is there a microphone for... Yeah, thank you very much. I think I'm grateful to the online participants. These are very pertinent questions um, that underpin how we do things uh, to ensure that um, the IRC functions in an equitable, equitable manner. And and some of these um, feedback and the questions are what is going to push us to defining further how the IRC should operate. So my answer to that will be, um, it would, um, we will work on this um, to make sure that in defining the charter, some of the um, issues about equity uh, will be key elements of the charter of the IRC. That's what I can say. Thank you. And of course, it was also a pity that uh, Tana could not participate because she was especially on inclusivity. So. Exactly. Yeah, all right. Thank you very much. Um, for a small round of questions. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Harold Roy McCauley. I'm the Managing Director for Regions and Partners, CGIR. Um, first of all, I would like to congratulate um, Irene and, and the whole team. I think this is a great idea, but it's just the beginning. Um, I know it's it's a tough job, but I know we can do it. First question is um, on the governance issue. Um, I just wonder, um, you quickly presented it, but I was thinking, um, isn't there a better way of presenting the governance issue? Um, it's just just a quick thought about it. And um, I thought it, I looked at what you presented, I thought it to be very big and maybe we can scale that down and see how we can, we can fit that into something that exists so that we, we're having um, maybe um, less costs, transaction costs. That's the first thing. The second thing is, um, I think the, the data um, base is, to me, is one of the most important elements of the IRC. And um, you're talking about sustainability. So um, my next question is, how would you exploit the database to to ensure sustainability. I think that's a good opportunity and we shouldn't miss that. So we, we need to think about how we could use that rather than you know looking at, well, in addition to expecting countries and funders, but I think the database would be something that would bring much more sustainability to the IR. Thank you. Thank you. And there's also a question to the other side of the room. Thank you very much. My name is Patrick Ukori. I am the executive sector of the forum. And thank you for this, uh, this uh, initiative. I was listening. I Two things, thoughts struck me that are worth thinking about. Generally, platforms come and they tend to serve the immediate interests. And, and so the platform must have ability to respond or to evolve to the changing circumstances. And agriculture is a very evolving um, subject area. So I think that 
because it is evolving and it is a very broad sector with not very clear boundaries, it's important for you to have a very good niche. And that means, among others, to define your, the value proposition of the IRC. Who is the client? What is the client going to benefit from this? What does the IRC expect from the client as well? That has to be clear so that it is a, you, you, once you frame those things, the, your value proposition very clearly, the question of sustainability starts becoming less complicated. In many cases, sustainability is an issue when the value proposition is not very clear. In others, the demand and supply are not talking to one another. That's one. I think the second one, it's important also in structuring the, I, the, the IRC to focus on a few, I think their biggest niche, this is how I see it, is going to be a bit more medium to longer term strategic areas that are more stable uh, and you need to have a large pool of data and large uh, uh, data set points to make conclusions. And climate change is a good one. But if you're going for low hanging fruits like tons per hectare yield and this and that, I think it's not, it's, it won't just fly because that information most of it are just too low hanging. They're already yesterday's science is known. But I think looking at the futures, the medium to the longer term, how they affect production, the changes in the food systems and all those types of things that shape the broader direction of what we do is a niche that is good for the IRC. And that way there will be less crowding up there in fact, they might be attracting more strategic investments. That would be my comment. Thank you very much. Others, I appreciate the initiative. I think it's a wonderful idea to have such an initiative between the North and the South. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Conan. Um, well, considering the, the governance uh, and also to look at the database, how to use it for sustainability, also reflects a little bit on uh, the, the questions of uh, Mrs. Uh, O'Connor, how we create sustainability, how we can use our own data sets for sustainability. Um, sorry, I mean, I'm again looking at you. <laughs> and the, the microphone, please. Sorry, can we have the microphone over here, please? Yeah, thank you very much. Again, very important questions uh, that informs the discourse uh, we're having. Um, in terms of the sustainability aspect, I, I do agree, but of course we, we need to be careful how, because the data in itself is a public good and, and how you're going to use that to I commercialize it in order to build sustainability. That's that's one thing. So the idea is that as a member of the IRC, then you are um, entitled to, to using the data that is so generated. Maybe for those who are not members, I will have to uh, look at that. Then the issue of the governance, um, as was mentioned, the SIDA's governance system is similar to what we address. So there are examples and models that we, we have seen and lessons that have been learned uh, should be inputted in, in the IRC. Um, we are at a stage of trying to operationalize the IRC. So all the points we are making are very important. We need to pay attention to that as we operationalize, learn lessons and make sure that we are adding value uh, to um, the, the members uh, within the IRC. Um, I talked about the network of networks and the importance of, of adding value. Um, and that brings to the question on the value proposition. I think the IRC has a, a strong value proposition. We even have a differentiated value proposition, but of course, in a presentation like that, you, it's not possible to, to say a lot. But I get the point that is being made that once the value proposition is, is properly done, 
it begins to now deal with sustainability issues. So we need to go back and, and look at the value proposition as we are operationalizing it to improve um, our chances, uh, ensuring that the IRC is sustainable. Um, so I think all in all, these comments, I think are important towards the operationalization process, which is the objective of the side event, to, to just get the inputs and be able to factor it into the, the process. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. I'm looking at the chairman, I think. I, I would agree actually in the value uh, in the interest of time um, that we proceed. And um, I, uh, I thank all of the audience, uh, both uh, in the room and online, for the questions and uh, look forward to our future collaboration with all of you. And thank you, Jelle, uh, Mars, and Anti Audio for collecting for us uh, these interesting uh, contributions. Um, and uh, before giving the word to our last speakers, um, a few let's say words of, of, of summary. Um, I think we have heard um, a lot of arguments for strategic orientation of the IRC and practical next steps. So strategic orientation, the foresight will add to strategic orientation, the um, let's, say, let's say flexibility for funders uh, to follow political priorities, um, from the European side, we have Green Deal Farm to Fork um, and food system co-benefits from South Africa. We have heard the need actually um, of accountability of uh, public funders towards um, public rules. Elements, let's say for strategic thinking and elements for practical um, um, application in the um, IRC. We have heard about the close link uh, to farmers and uh, with tools like living labs, like multi-actor uh, projects uh, and um, the need actually to, to think about the linkages. And as we have as many food systems as we have, uh, let's say local, different local situations, there are opportunities uh, of linking um, farmers in a multi-actor approach uh, to, to the IRC. Um, I think from the private sector, we have heard uh, interesting focus more on the, let's say, big tickets, like also climate footprint, um, climate adaptation, uh, not, let's say, the smaller things where all science has already provided solutions. So just a few remarks. And now I would like to invite our last speaker, Stefan Onakuse, uh, to come to the front. I would like to uh, make one uh, suggestion uh, because uh, Jenna was absent. Um, we lacked the involvement of the youth. And we have a small statement and uh, we have use the present uh, in the form of uh, Kofi, and he promised to keep it really short. So uh -huh. if he can just have one minute, please. Okay, that's an excellent proposal. <laughs> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed speakers and uh, panelists. I'll keep it really short. Um, greetings from Jenna, who wasn't able to be here and um, we're sure she'll be with us the next time. Um, reading Jenna's passionate speech, uh, my mind was drawn to one part, which is asking why we are including youth. This group is critically important to the food systems we want to see today and for the next generations. We youth of the global south often and our livelihood within the food and agricultural space. But yet we are very mobile and uh, we are very mobile demographic. We, we all in the room must have observed that youth are most often protagonists in um, rural urban migration, for example. And then youth 
are being observed as increasingly important in um, with a political voice. Yes. Therefore, the IRC opens up an opportunity for more meaningful youth engagement and even the engagement of women as well. And this will be essential for bringing up the current and next generation to support food systems research thinking. YPAD is committed to um, position itself with an IRC, which is grounded in the moment with intergenerational collaboration. Thank you, um, ladies and gentlemen. I, I hope it captured everything Jenna wanted to say, but we'll put it in a blog post and share with all partners. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Kofi, for this statement. We should have uh, missed it, so it's good to have it, let's say, in the minutes of this uh, of this meeting. Um, yeah, in addition to all the very interesting, innovative uh, booths which we have outside, actually, of this conference room, where we see all the young graduates and innovators actually presenting uh, presenting their results. Um, certainly an element which is of value to all big conferences uh, to show this element of uh, young entrepreneurs, young innovators. Now I would like to ask uh, Stefan, he's a senior lecturer, Dr. Stefan Onakius is a senior lecturer in the Department of Food Business and Development and Deputy Director of the Center for Sustainable Livelihoods, Cork University Business School. University College uh, Cork and the president of the European Alliance on Agriculture Knowledge for Development, Athena Tour, steering committee member of the Tropical Agriculture Platform uh, at FAO. He holds a diploma in general agriculture, um, BSc in agriculture sciences from the University of um, Abukuta, uh, MSc in environmental biology, entomology from the University of Ibadan, um, PhD in Cooperative Organization, Food Marketing and Rural Development, in Food Business and um, Postgraduate Certificate in Teaching and Learning um, in Higher Education at the University College Cork Island. Um, Dr. Nakus is the UCC uh, PI on the European Union Desira funded project on climate smart agriculture research and innovation support for dairy value chains in Eritrea and um, the EPA project on sustainable production and uh, consumption, the impact of uh, social norms, and we all know the valuable contribution of Patri Natura. So, not much to say more. It, uh, over to you, it's your turn, please. Thank you very much. Um, I think you made my job very easy by helping me to analyze all the things I had wanted to say. So instead of the two minutes, I'll spend one minute. I, I just want to say thank you to all of you who took time to participate in this uh, side event this afternoon. Uh, these are critical issues that we are discussing, looking at uh, how we collectively structure and chart, uh, chart, our, chart a future for all of us in terms of research, innovation, and how to carry agriculture and food security issues in Africa forward. Uh, just, to, just to highlight some of the things that have been said, I just want to uh, add to the list of uh, things you mentioned, uh, things that have been mentioned here. We talk about research and innovation priorities in terms of how IROC will help in this area of prioritizing research and innovation. Alignment between the two continents, something that feature very prominently here, data management, data management and database, operationalization, which is very critical about how the future and the long-term survivability or sustainability of IROC will be. We talk about the foresight, because we are not just looking for short term, we are looking for something that will last us for decades. We talk about IROC working for stakeholders. How do we structure and bring about the inclusion of this uh, framework for funders? It's something that came very prominent 
how do we design a framework that is inclusive enough? And the last one is transformation of agri food system, which is something that is, has become a buzzword for everybody in this uh, in this modern time. So over the past few hours, we have witnessed exchanges of valuable uh, insights on the forging of collaboration, partnership, and the laying of the uh, laying of a groundwork for impactful research activities through the work of IROC. So our journey to operationalize this consortium began with a shared vision of bringing together the brightest minds from across the globe to tackle some of the most pressing challenges facing our world today. Through collaboration, because I don't know, no one person can solve all the problems. It is only through collaboration and partnership. So I think all of us working together, putting all our hands on deck, we will aim to generate more innovative solutions towards solving the problems we face in the area of agriculture, especially climate change, technology, food and nutrition security. And this side event is not, this is not the end, I would say, because I, I think I attended one in Ghana where we had a very serious discussion during the launch. So there are futuristic opportunity for people to come up with their insight, their view, their thoughts, and the best way to take IROC forward. So on that note, I want to honestly, on behalf of uh, all the panelists that, that did a very great job in explaining things to us and they were patient enough to take our questions. Uh, the moderator, thank you so much. And let me come back to somebody I call uh, the mother of IROC, Irene. Thank you very much. I, I, I can't imagine, I wish I have the kind of uh, courage you have. You, I don't think you have brakes, you don't stop. Please don't go to the mechanic to put uh, brake pads, continue going. So thank you very much for continue to take us forward and uh, we look forward to another fruitful discussion in the future. Thank you so much. Irene, uh, can I call you to the front uh, to give a few uh, remarks on next steps, please? Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. I think just a few points. Um, this is just the beginning. We are anticipating to start the operationalization process. And therefore, this is one of many such events. We are uh, hoping that each of the partners, uh, Roof Forum has uh, hosted this and um, ensure that we have a space to discuss um, among reform constituents. Uh, I'm sure that uh, reform is going to take this forward in other platforms and engage uh, some more on the IRC. Um, we need to have a whole dossier of inputs that will go into the operationalization process. When we listened to Dr. Jim uh, Woodhill, who presented the uh, triggers of the, of the food systems transformation, you can almost see the number of uh, factors that uh, go into the dynamic of, of having an effective IRC. So I think by way of next steps, every platform, I think AFAS is going to have one if you can create a similar platform for that discussion, because everything we are saying here is not to be implemented at the top, it's to be implemented at the, at the local area by farmers and, and the working groups, I think, should engage um, at the local level. So I, I, all I would say uh, is to thank um, all the wonderful inputs. We're going to pack it that it's going to help us uh, in the operationalization process. We have to work hard to bring farmers. We have to work hard to bring private sector. There are a number of um, actors that we have very few. Um, a representation of so there's a lot of work uh, ahead um i cannot say um, we are at the point of waiting for the grant agreement um, on the csa so we are we're waiting once the commission is concluded then we will know um in terms of date time of when 
the process will start, but for sure, uh, these inputs uh, will be key uh, to, to that uh, process. So, Mr. Chair, um, these are the two main next steps is to call on, on all partners to help us to explain the IRC among the constituents and to be able to get as much inputs as possible. So, thank you very much uh, for all your inputs. And those who are online, you've been great. I mean, now we even still have over 30 people online. Um, when we started, they were around 60 or 70 or so, and they stayed with us. So thank you very much uh, for doing the great job. My co-facilitators, both online and, and in person, uh, I'm grateful uh, to all of you, to the technical team, who I told should, should look at me <laughs> when I'm speaking. I'm grateful. Kofi and Emmanuel, thank you so much. You've been great, 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 great uh, to support this process and give us um, the platform. And finally, of course, to the, the Executive Secretary of the Forum. I think uh, we are most grateful uh, for moving this agenda um, within this platform. And we pray that you will take that uh, forward um, in other platforms. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, for your own leadership uh, of, of this, this side event. And of course, for the Commission for supporting those of us who were able to travel to this place. I shouldn't forget that. Uh, kudos to all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ayn, for, for closing. And there will be more information on the IRC to come in future events. For example, on the 4th to 5th of December, the Food 2030 conference will explore in a session how in partnerships of the European Union, the Food Systems Partnership, and PRIMA, the partnership across the Mediterranean, could interact with the IRC. So Dr. Irene Frimpong will give a presentation and for you more opportunities uh, to, to hear more, more updates, uh, in the future and register now if you are interested. Thank you very much for staying so long with us and wishing you um, a nice evening and uh, fruitful further discussions in Ruforum. Thank you.